Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast, is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our podcast network, head to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Constellation, Last Day Media's conversational podcast. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined, as always, by my brother, Dagan Moriarty. Looks like he's about to close a deal. Dagan, <laughs> how are you today, my friend? <laughs> Looking pretty snazzy yeah, over here. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> Greetings and salutations yourself. Oh, man, it's been a friggin... It's been a whirlwind of a week, man. Two visits to the emergency room with one of the kiddos. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, on two different nights this week. You don't talk to anyone, week. so that's probably why we don't know. <laughs> 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 well, mom and dad know. They okay. they know because they have to be uh, – if they're not kept in the loop. You know, it's like even when you have that thing where you're like you're waiting for news, so you don't want to say anything because you don't want to startle anybody. <laughs> like they have to know immediately. Like if they don't know from the jump, it's just going to be more of a headache for me. <clears throat> so on the way to the emergency room, I'm like – we're taking Lil's to the emergency room. What does, so, she, what does she have? She she was <laughs> having like pretty bad abdominal pains when she got out of dance like Tuesday night. And she came home. She was like burning it at both ends, you know, like school and then dance for three hours or something. Got home eight and then went to bed and then woke up a couple hours later throwing up. And But it was like a pain. It was like an abdominal pain, like an acute pain. So... She ended up going to the emergency room with Helene like one in the morning. They got home at four. They did like some tests, but they just said, you know what? She's just kind of, it's either a stomach virus or she has like gas pains or whatever it was. They kind of dismissed it. And then Thursday night, same exact thing. So we're like, all right, we have to go in for a CAT scan. Like there could be something bigger at play, like maybe a kidney stone or something. She's got a ball right? of yarn stuck in her like a cat. <laughs> she needs to cough up a hairball yeah. or something. <laughs> But the kidney stone would have been on brand for Lilia because she's a 16 year old that eats like a 16 year old. You know, it's like Taco Bell. It's like a, it's like Papa John's Taco Bell and Panera bread, like on rotation. And she also like, weighs like 72 like, pounds, which is the strange. Yeah, part. she's like a she's like a waif, but she eats like shit. So I'm thinking, okay, this is a kidney stone. So last night in the emergency room again, they ran all the tests. Total clean bill of health. Turns out in dance, she's competing now because it's the spring. She got up too fast and pulled a, either pulled a tendon away from her, from her rib or like a muscle tear Ugh. or a pinched nerve like underneath one of the lower back ribs. And they were dismissing it as like some kind of GI thing when it was just a sort of a physical. Bunch of quacks. <laughs> Two different visits to the emergency room for that. And she, she, it sucks because she's in pain. She, I th- and I think it could be like a pinched nerve type of thing. But yeah, man, it was like uh, in total this week, it was like an eight hour ordeal in both visits to the hospital. It's just like that on top of everything. It's just like nice co-pays on there. Parents. Yeah, we, uh, we'll see. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what can you do? Like yeah. you go in with the, the high end PPO and you kind of just cross your fingers and hope for the best. Like, yeah. What, I don't know what, what, you're, yeah, you what do? else you're supposed to do here in these what, United what States. Yeah. <laughs> It's so funny, man, the people, the way people react to the ER, because I've been to the ER several times in my life, but not probably since I broke my collarbone when I was in high school. Definitely not. Mm. And there have been many times, not many, but several times in my life where I'm like, I probably should go to the ER and I just, I just ride it out. <laughs> yeah. Like with my, with my own stomach issues, like I have horrifying stomach issues as people know. And sometimes it's like, I'm not so sure about, there was, I, I told you, I think I, there was a time when I was at dad's where I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm dying. Uh, it was right before Comic-Con. Yeah. And and I was talking to dad on the phone and he was like having none of it. I was, it was, I was like in my twenties and he was at the cop hog or whatever <laughs> at his office. And I'm like, dad, I think I should go to the hospital or something. He's like, you're fine. You're fine. I'll be home at seven. You know, <laughs> like, all right, fair enough. But I, I think, let me think here. Three times I know I went to the ER. I cut my eye like above my eye on mother's day, 1991 at grandma's house when I was playing hockey. Okay. This is when they had the glass Gatorade bottle still. We were shooting at them and then one of them broke and, and slashed me in my eye. And I remember coming home to grandma's house like with, like this. And people thought I like <laughs> fucked my eye up. And it was just. <laughs> he took some shrapnel. But uh, I definitely almost did fuck my eye up. And then uh, I don't think it's going to come through. But I have a really. I don't know if it's going to come through. Maybe for some people. I have a really bad scar on my hand here. Oh, I never That's knew like, that. And that comes from. Uh, 
dad was going, I, I've said this on sacred before. I think dad, I was in high school and dad was like going to one of his meetings, you know, like his like, you know, new age meetings that he we used to go to or whatever. And like in the middle, you know, in the week, like Thursday nights, he has this and Wednesday. So I'm, I'm watching who wants to be a millionaire. This is probably 2000 or something like that. I have a glass of Coke on the ground, like in the, in the kitchen, <laughs> in the, in the, uh, living room, dad's leaving, going out the door. I go, I put my hand down to get up off the couch, crush the glass under me, cut my hand oh, open. Shit. I remember dad being like, <sighs> And like, co- like coming back inside and like wrapping my hand up and bringing me to the hospital. And then the third time was my my collarbone. And Allie met me at the, which is our sister, met me there. My my friend Cody's mom brought me to the hospital, but then she met me there. And Allie was yelling at all the nurses to clean all my cuts up because they were just letting me like sit there. And that's my major memory of that. You got to have that one person. Yeah, and then uh, like to annoy the nurses. And uh, yeah, so that's 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 it. Hopefully, um, hopefully I die in my sleep and I never have to go to the ER again. The ER is harsh. Oh, Jesus Christ. Harsh. Yeah. Chris Reagan, good to see you, my friend. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm t- t- doing better than all you guys, apparently. Yeah. Holy yeah. Fuck. <laughs> God damn. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. I was, I was thinking about... Cause you said, I love the idea of the phrase, I'm pretty sure I'm going to die. <laughs> like coming like saliently out of somebody. Well, it's who, like... Is, it's, who clearly is not about to die. Well, yeah, it's like, you know, when you he- I, I don't know how, how people feel about this, but when you feel a new, unique and severe pain. Yeah, like, yeah. Hmm. I might be dying. Yeah, like that's yeah. Se- that seems fairly severe. This might be the hand of Christ coming to pull me into this <laughs> screeching afterlife. <laughs> right. That right. might, might just be what this is. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm doing OK. I, just before we started recording, Dagan was the last person in. He was he was like, oh, I'm sorry, guys, I couldn't find my phone. And he goes, oh, there it is. And I immediately felt this intense jealousy. Because I've been looking for my fucking sound system remote for about a month now, and it's been driving me insane. I don't understand where this remote could possibly be. It's a remote control. It doesn't leave the house. So it's in here, Mm. hiding, stealthing around Mm. somewhere. And it's, I wake up every day and I have to take like a deep exhale. It's like, I'm not going to find it today, but it's here. And it's the, the most infuriating thing that I think I've experienced in a while, which is good. That's the worst. I, uh, I experienced that. Michael asked me because I experienced that with my ear, but like my AirPods every once in a while. Oh my I, God. I often only have one in my ear so I can hear things around me if I'm listening to like a podcast or whatever. And then sometimes if I'm doing something, I'll just put it down instead of putting it back in the case. And then I like cannot find it. And what pisses <laughs> me the fuck off is all of these like find my iPhone features like they just don't work. It's like beep. Beep, damn it. I'm telling I'm like telling you to beep. I know you have power. And it's like looking for iPod, iPad, you know, or iPod and then circles. And it's like cannot make noise. It's like, why not? You're a fucking headphone. <laughs> I think what they're afraid of clearly. And I think this is obvious is you fucking with someone because. Oh, yeah. You, they can have them in your, their ears and then you'd be like, find iPod. Be like, oh, like in there. Yeah. And then you can deafen them. <laughs> huh. I'm losing all sorts of shit. I was watching a video, though, a couple of days ago. This guy caught his wife cheating or whatever, and she he used like some sort of tracking device in her, in her car, and she found it with some sort of device you use, I guess, like to track for electronic signals. So maybe you can get one of those, you know, like a <laughs> wand. Like, that's like spy versus spy. Yeah, it's shit. Like, yeah Mr. and Mrs. Smith or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Micah. Hello. Well, I don't know. We're calling you Micah Moriarty now, right? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Yeah. That is I. It just feels so braggadocious on my part. (laughs) It's like, oh, I've made a Moriarty. (laughs) Michael Moriarty, welcome to the show, my wife. How are you today, my dear? I'm doing very well. Uh, And you know what, Chris, my boy, we're going to help you find that lost item. We're going to use a little witchcraft. All right, Chris, what what you got to do? I'm now does this work? I have no idea, but I found it on Google. Okay. You're supposed to picture the object in your mind and picture a silver thread wrapping itself around it. And while you picture that, you're supposed to say what is lost is now found as my magic circles round. <laughs> and really, hopefully we'll really find it. Because, co- I mean, it's, it's, it's better than whatever the hell can you, yeah, we, can I, can, we try. Can I tell you something? I'm so desperate that I'm not, I'm not even, there's like a not 0% chance that I might try that. Do it right now. <laughs> no, I'm not doing. I'm not doing that right now. Why wait? Dost it was thou a top like to result live, on Google. Does thou, thou like to live deliciously? 
the th- the thing about <laughs> the thing about that the thing about that that upsets me is that I would never see if I do that and then I find it I would never be comfortable in my life again. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Because then that that would kind yeah, of freak you out. That that would up to, that would overturn the balance of things. That would be like. That would be like seeing a car accident on the side of the road and you, you like go check it out. I was like, oh, what's that? And there's like a minion driving it. <laughs> and you're just like, every, this is beyond anything that I can possibly comprehend at this moment. And I don't think I have the power to process this. I, th- I don't know, man. Evoke Black Phillip right now. I mean, <laughs> not only could you, this could work, but you would, your epiphany would be right here on the podcast. I, don't, I mean, this is good podcast. I, gotta I, gotta I don't want to ever seen The Witch Man. I got to show her that movie. Oh, I no. don't know. It's no, so good. Too scared. I listened to no, the knockback like, about it because I was, I knew I'd be too scared to watch it. So I do that frequently. I'm like, I'll just listen to the knockback episode about it and experience it that way. Yeah. But Helene got about 30 seconds into it and was like, I'm not watching this. Really? <laughs> Yeah, it's scary. I mean, that's one of the I think what I love about that movie is just all the natural light. It's like, holy shit, this is so so fucking beautiful and that you have to watch it. And I remember watching it for 20 minutes or so and being like, I have no they're speaking like late middle English, basically. So I'm like, I have no idea what they're speaking. And then you have to watch it with subtitles and then it's a lot. But at least for me, it was a lot better. It's something very I'm not going to spoil it, but something very disturbing happens like in the front. It could be insinuated like it's off. It's off screen. Mm-hmm. But something very disturbing happens in the first minute or two. And Helene's like, I can't. <laughs> I was but like, you, all right, fuck. But you have yeah. to watch it with subtitles. But I mean, I watch everything with subtitles. Anyway, Me too. So. I do too. Yeah. I don't like loud televisions. This is something that we talk about on Sacred Symbols. Dustin was very nice. He gave us a, a beautiful sound bar, which we have up in our loft. But I was telling him, like, I don't understand this idea of watching a flat image and then wanting the sound all around you. Mm. It just doesn't compute. It's like, I just want a little bit of sound coming from the image itself. The only thing I want surround sound for is music, you know? Um, Right. Anyway, Chris, let's go to you. I want to go to your topic. We finally stumbled upon one. I have to share with you our listener made document of all of the things we've talked about, which I also have to look at every time I do a topic. (laughs) And even then I've still done like three repeat topics. So uh, we go over to you. All right. Well, uh, let me see which one. I forgot which one I chose exactly because I had like eight. <laughs> you had essential <laughs> I luxuries, I think. I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Essential right. luxuries. So uh, I was thinking about this kind of recently. I mean, I think about this all the time just based on just just because being alive is this. It's, it's, the, it's the expenditure of money and losing money all the time, regardless of whether or not you want it or need it. And I was thinking about just some of the things that I – will splurge on regardless like i i it is it is essential to the cost of being alive to me even though it is technically a luxury and you don't technically need it um and what are those things for like the third the first thing that comes to mind for me immediately and this was especially true when i moved to california was air conditioning i i don't if the air conditioning were to get Two hundred, three dollars, three hundred dollars more expensive. That's just that is simply the new floor. That is the new cost of living because I refuse. I, I refuse. I refuse to live in a place where I am just physically uncomfortable. Do with you know anyone in it? Do you know anyone in LA that ha- that lives without an air conditioner? I knew one person last when I lived there, and I was like, "Whoa, wow. no!" Yeah. I, I I haven't been to any of those. I. I th- there's central air and then there's like the in you the in window unit right. air conditioners which like that's more common um than like i've seen that more often than i've seen no air conditioning like that's that's cr- fucking crazy although you could argue you don't really you could argue that a lot of buildings in california need insulation now because it's actually getting significantly colder than it really ever has but yeah man like i i just i remember moving here initially and s- s- crashing at my friend's apartment and it was so fucking hot. It was like in the middle of the drought, like 2015. It was like 75 degrees at night in December. And I just remember like sweating on this couch. It was so hot on that couch that I would throw my blanket in the freezer and wait five minutes and then come and grab it and like wrap myself up in it and like try to pass, like pass out um, before the heat overtook the blanket again. And it was miserable. And I remember I would be like, all right, you know, I would wake up in the middle and I was like, look, I'm turning this air conditioner on. I'll pay them. I will I will give them money. <laughs> I, I, I don't care. I am destitute right now at this very moment, but I will I will expend everything. Sure. Every every <laughs> ounce of capital that I possibly can 
just to get a fucking good night's sleep and not sweat like a dog while I'm unconscious, you know? And it's just, that's, that's, that's the one that immediately came to mind for me where it's just like this, this really could cost as much. You, you could charge as much as possible for this. And I would probably, I would probably forego meals to simply <laughs> exist comfortably. It's too important. I totally agree with you. I, I would go even further and just say climate control, like centrals, even zoned mm-hmm. climate control is like such a amazing luxury. There's yeah. this, this journalist I follow, Josh Barrow, and he always make, he's always like pseudo making fun of Europeans about how they don't have air conditioners and like dryers and shit like that. Yeah. Um, like at anywhere near the per capita. And it's true. Like it's a very uniquely American thing at a really wide level to have total climate control inside your house. And it is the nature of this weird country we live in with all these varied, you know, climates and microclimates and all the rest. But it's funny, man, because when I lived in San Francisco, it was so cool all the time that no one had AC. It was like very uncommon to have AC in your house, like even the option to have AC unless you lived in like one of the new luxury units or whatever. And it was perfect. But then you guys had like a sea breeze, right? Like basically, basically. Yeah, which I is always like- yeah. The the peninsula is such a unique thing. I wish I. I mean, I'm sure you can read about the like why the climatology climate the climate is the way it is there, but uh, yeah, it's like a very unique microclimate that only exists on the peninsula. That's like totally divorced from everything around it. Is very weird and great sweatshirt weather. I would leave my sliding door in my bedroom open every night, and I it faced the ocean like 25 blocks away. Yeah. Um, not New York blocks, San Francisco blocks. That would be like a mile or so. And then, uh, you know, just have that air coming in constantly. It was, it was wonderful, but here it's fucking disgusting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's either cold or warm. It's very rarely comfortable. So that's a nice, any other luxuries? I mean, there's, there's, there's some stuff. I, I, I personally, it's, it's the big one for me. Like climate control is, is really the only one that I think is, is truly like a make or break thing where like I could, like I, I, I would. I remember looking for apartments, and there was someone was like, "Yeah, we don't have central air." It's like, okay, well, I'm not. I have no interest. That would be tough. Sorry. Like, what the what? You want me to die here? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I remember, like, the first apartment I lived in had one AC unit in the living room, or like it was like uh, it was like off that the layout of that apartment was so frustrating. It was it was a corner apartment. The door opened in the wrong way. <laughs> it was so stupid, but it was in like the dining room kitchen. And my room was basically the only room that didn't face it. So my room, you could feel like a, like a 10 degree temperature difference going in from my room out into like the main area of the apartment. And it was so horrible. I remember sleeping with like an, one of those vertical oscillating fans under my blanket just to keep me from <laughs> just to keep me from dying. But. I don't know. I, I was trying to think of other ones and, and other ones for me didn't necessarily come to mind. I have some friends who will like insist on like, I need a, I need this specific car, you know, mm-hmm. like, and it's just like, I will pay anything for this specific car. I don't care. It'll be a lot. And it, that's, what's fascinating to me is that it varies so, so wildly between people. Cause he doesn't give a shit about AC at all. He just braves it. I don't know how the fuck he does it. Makes no sense. Um, he doesn't use his AC at all. It's like, it's too expensive. I'm like, you are, First of all, you can afford this, so I don't know what the fuck you're being so stingy about. <laughs> but I'm not coming over now. <laughs> well, yeah, it would be, it would be not gross. Doing it. Yeah, yeah, it's horrible. Micah, talk to us about an essential luxury. Yeah, I struggled to come up with some like in the same spirit of Chris's because, as you mentioned, so my best friend insists that anywhere she lives has to have a bathtub, right? So like when her and her husband were browsing new mm. apartments, and it's like if it doesn't have a bathtub. I don't want it. And for me, it's like I haven't taken a bath in like 15 years. So it's not even something I think about. Right. Uh, AC, definitely. But I grew up in a place where central air is extremely uncommon. And like my parents' house doesn't have AC. So like they have a window unit in the kitchen. I think Mm. they have one in their bedroom. And when I moved here, I gave them my window unit AC. And now they have one in the living room. So they have those that they run for an hour at a time and then shut them off because they're cheap. <laughs> and like when I lived with them for a few months, uh, when I was waiting like for my apartment to be ready, I, I didn't have AC in my room on the second floor. And it was awful. But I yeah. realized like this is how I lived my whole life. We we never had ACs like in the children's rooms. And you did just every summer just deal with it. <laughs> the difference. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, as an adult now, definitely AC is is the way to go. Like at, at any point in which 
I finally bring Colin like to my hometown to see it. We're not staying with my parents. And I don't care if it comes off as rude because it's like, I'm not living in this hell hole <laughs> if I don't have to. I will stay in the hotel down the street, but there's no way that I'm not going to have AC in the middle of summer. It's, it's ridiculous. The, uh, so that as an adult, yeah, that, bath, that's definitely one I want. The bathtub thing is interesting because I hadn't considered it necessarily, but I think it is something that is kind of a core deciding factor for me too. Now, really? after living in an apartment where like, so our second apartment, which is our, our biggest one, it was when I was living with um, King, my friend Sweeney and, and Jalen and Joe, we, we, all of us. I had a, my own bathroom, but it was just like a standing shower. And I was like, oh, OK, whatever. Like it's got central air. There was the, the building had a pool or whatever. Like I can this is this is great. Whatever. That apartment was terrible. There was like roaches and shit. It was terrible. <laughs> Turns out. But. I remember being genuinely frustrated at certain points because I just wanted to sit in like a I just wanted to I like hot tubs a lot. Like it's like if, if I'm ever going on vacation or for whatever reason, like I try to make sure that I get like some time in a hot tub because I just I like <laughs> boiling. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and living in that apartment without even just the ability to get halfway there with just like a tub of hot water just to sit and like relax in was deeply frustrating to me. And so, like, I think now, like, that might be, but that's not, a, I, don't, I, I know what you mean, where, like, that's probably, like, an essential, but is it, is it more expensive than a standing shower? I actually don't um, know. I assume maybe. I don't know, but, like, most of, like, all the apartments I looked at had stall showers. So I'm guessing right. that is the cheapest option. I just think it's spatial. I think it's a spatial that. thing, too. It's you know? smaller, yeah. I, I guess to yeah. me, I, I look at, because you could just. The thing to me is, I guess, the versatility of a bathtub where it's like that that is a standing shower if you just want to use it that way. So like, why, oh, exactly. why, so why wouldn't you want to have like a versatile shower unit where you could use it in whatever way you f wanted that? I don't know. There's something about standing showers that feels like. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Fair enough. It feels it feels it, it feels like you're being punished in some way or, or like you're like not that you're in prison exactly, but like. <sighs> yeah, no, don't worry. It's, that, well, that, that's I, well, dude, I love having bat. Like a, I'm sad that we don't have a. We have a bath actually in our second. We have what do we? What was it? We have two and a half baths. We have is that two what and they a half. Say? Yeah, yeah. So, um, in the the full bathroom up here, that's like not the master bathroom. There's like a like a full bath, but it's a, so small. I've I took a bath in it a couple of times, and it's like basic. It's like a. It's like a. I don't know. I'm like in a thimble or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but for me, we ha in our master bathroom, we have a. So again, I bought this house new, but it was a spec house. So it was just whatever they wanted to do. Um, so one of the choices they made, the builders made was to do a, a so-called his and her shower, which I had never even heard of in my entire life. Um, so it's like a, it's a really, it's cool. It's like a long shower with two heads on either side. And, sh and Michael literally has her side of the shower and I have my side of the shower, like permanently. Um, huh. We don't often shower at the same time, but I guess it allows you to, to like, get ready for work at the same time or whatever, whatever you want to do. But as soon as I moved in here, I was like, I really would love to put a bathtub in here and get rid yeah. of one of those showers. But then it's a, that's a to do. And my mind's already on the, like doing another house at some point and maybe just yeah. leaving things the way they are. But that's like a, that is a disappointment because in Santa Monica in that apartment where we founded sacred symbols, mm -hmm. I used to take baths all the time and it was dope. We had yeah. two big baths in that, in that apartment. Which was weird. Oh, yeah. wow. So, you oh, and yeah, Chris could is, both be no. bath boys at the same time. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. The, <laughs> having a bath with my boys. Yeah. We could have done podcast that way. We should have. <laughs> yeah, that would have been nice. We did think That would have been funny. I lived in that master bathroom bathtub. I was in that thing all of the goddamn time, just getting high and reading or yeah. hoping I didn't drop my phone in the water. Dude, it's relaxing. Oh it, it is it just there. It, it's relaxing to just sit in like boiling water. I don't know what it I is. It. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is historically or why or, or evolutionarily why that's comfortable. But it's like, especially in the winter when it's just cold and you just got like a, a hot bath, dude, it's, it's good. No, it's great. That's yeah, the best. There, there was a guy I lived with in San Francisco. It was very wasteful, but he taught me the trick because um, he used to do this and we we would yell at him because our fucking water bill was so high and he would end up paying like a, a majority of the water bill because of it. But you take a <laughs> bath. He would take baths every day. Um, he was, again, one of the Jameses I lived with. We had straight James by James and gay James. This was gay James. And uh, he would take a bath every day, but he would have this thing where he would like open the the drain just a little, like a, a very, very little bit and then run the water 
like a steaming hot just Stay a hot. very little bit and it would just constantly churn because you know the water does get a little more lukewarm but it's a very modest way to do it and he would sit in there for hours oh my god and uh i was like damn that's luxury dude that i have is. absolutely i have absolutely sat in the bath for like three hours oh yeah totally oh my a million, god a million no, this percent. Though- this is literally the meme I just told Colin about the other day. And it was like someone at a party and they're like, are you the guy who sets all those weird records? And he says, no, I'm the guy who takes the longest baths in the city. <laughs> and like, <laughs> That's a good joke. So Chris is, you know, getting a run for his money from this James character. We're going to have to we're going to have to have a showdown, a bath time showdown. We got to see yeah. who brings the bath bombs, who brings the rubber duckies. All right. Oh, I don't get oh, I don't get crazy. I just boil. No. I just boil. Sometimes right. I'll do You're the sometimes do I'll do the, bay. sometimes I'll do the salts or whatever. But then oh. I get I, but then I get frayed because I, I get afraid because like I think I think about that guy who ate that guy in Florida or whatever. Well, don't eat them. <laughs> right, but like I don't, but like it's you know how like I guess I feel like you know how like when you put uh there's like certain like ointments or whatever and it's like oh it absorbs through your skin and it's like am I absorbing bath salts through my skin and getting like vaguely high is that what's is, is something happening <laughs> there would be middle aged women all over the United States murdering everyone if this was true so don't worry about I mean it. it's not necessarily not true yeah well that's 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 a good point I have been <laughs> yeah, watching a lot of crime, correlation a lot of ewu all right <laughs> um, oh so I oh, yeah, I actually sorry. say mine oh I'm sorry okay, yeah. no uh, so the one that I did come up with. Uh, is buying quality meats because mm. as I am now the adult and I cook a lot and I like to barbecue, my dad is the type of person and he cooks a lot, but my dad's the type of person be like, oh, it's all the same. You can buy the cheapest ground beef. It's the same as the more expensive ground beef. And until you like actually buy the slightly more expensive meat, you, you'll be like, sure, it's all the same. And it's not. All right. Like growing up, my dad always buys like the cheapest ground beef and it's full of little bone chips. And like, that's what you're used to, you know, and I I literally didn't know that there was another way until I had my own apartment. And one day Mm. the cheap ground beef was sold out. So I got the one that cost like a dollar more. And it's like, oh, it's not full of bone shards. Wow. Soft ground beef. What a, what a marvel of invention. And just realizing that all those years my dad told me, like, oh, it's the same thing. Don't worry about it. And it's like, it's not the same. <laughs> this is a better quality product. You don't like the this, bone this, shards? You know, it's like, I can't Especially believe you. that you suffer through this, father. Like, especially now, like the two kids are out of the house, my sister and I. So like my parents can afford to increase the food budget a few dollars. And they still insist on buying the absolute cheapest of everything. And it's like, just when it comes to meats, especially, which is the star of the show, generally speaking, you know, we usually have meat with every meal. So it's one of those things that I just am not going to skimp on anymore. And I'll say, too, I'm not saying that the store brand is always bad, but the store brand where I grew up was bad. The Publix ground beef here perfectly fine. I've never had an issue with the Publix ground beef, but the stop and shop ground beef, it's it's fucking crunchy. It's terrifying. And it's just like, it's just so bad. And I just remember thinking like, I, once you get away from it and you try ground beef that isn't full of sand and you're like, wow, imagine eating a meal and not getting a periodic crunch of something that shouldn't be in there every few bites. Like, yeah. I just couldn't believe it. So that that's really mine uh, as an adult is buying quality meats, especially if you're going to be barbecuing it. Now, the idea of barbecue, a lot of it is that you're taking tougher cuts of meat, which are usually cheaper, and you cook them low and slow so that they are, like you know, soft and tender. But even then, it's like I'm not starting with bottom of the barrel meat. All right. I'm not saying to go buy, you know, Wagyu beef, but... You know, if you start with the absolute cheapest, cheapest meat, there's there's not a lot you can do to make it better. So that that's yeah. mine. Genuinely is typically when it comes to groceries, you know, as, as a whole category, there are some items that are definitely just worth buying the better one, despite what my father told me all those years. I feel I agree with that, but I feel the exact opposite about eggs. 
Where like I feel like every egg I've ever had has been exact. It's been a fuck. It's that's an egg. Oh no, <laughs> definitely not. No. That's, that's definitely this not. Is, really there's no. difference. No, yeah, Chris just doesn't. You had you don't have an appreciation. For I just the maybe egg. I just I think just I just don't size. taste the. I think I just don't taste the. Di- well, the size. I, I'm so I'm small. Like it doesn't. <laughs> like I, don't, I only what does need that have to like, do with the size you being small because the, egg, the, the, egg, the, the egg. egg itself the normal egg is fine like I don't need more egg no, I don't need no. more of an egg I need an I'm Eggland's small. best large egg when it comes to eggs I'm a bit of a size queen you could say and I need an Eggland's best large egg to fill me up I, I just I don't know like I, I've tried every oh single I've because I because we've actually talked about this on the on the show before on on sacred I'm sure about like how I don't really have I don't really have brand loyalty to really anything like I will go I've only really lately in the last like year really settled on like okay this is the shampoo I'll get this is the soap I'll get but for the for like 30 years <laughs> I was very much not like I was just like oh that's soap if it's soap it must work you know like it's they wouldn't sell soap that isn't that that doesn't soap you know, like, so it must be fine. So I would just get random shit. Like I did, I don't even think I paid attention to the cost either. I would just be like, oh, whatever. This looks fine. This looks like something reputable. And I would just get it. And there was, there was like no consistency to it at all. And I'm very much the same with like certain foods and like eggs. Like I would, I would get farm fresh eggs. I would get, I would get eggs from the farmer's market. I would get eggs from the store. I would get the cheapest eggs from the store. I would get the most expensive eggs from the store. And I would make my scrambled eggs. And every day I would be like, these are, these are scrambled eggs. These are certainly eggs. <laughs> and I it can't. doesn't seem to make a goddamn difference. I, where I they think come you're from. right about the quality of the egg. Like, I don't know that I could ever differentiate between them. Maybe, maybe I could if people showed me, but I'm all about the size. Like that's right. what's so funny about even cooking with eggs when it's like one egg. It's like what that dude, that's like, well, you got to give me more information than that. One large egg, one small egg, one of the cheap little eggs you buy at Walmart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but but the the sizes of <laughs> eggs aren't so vast that, that that they're like on a scale of like, oh, a small couch versus a large couch. You know what I mean? Like a small egg and a large egg are still relatively about the size of an egg. Like it's not no, crazy. This man's not- never seen an Eggland's extra large, Colin. <laughs> have you ever is, seen how- an Eggland's extra large? I have no idea what the fuck you're talking Dude, about. Dude, you'd so be surprised. No. I would say egg- that there are I would big say eggs. That- I would are they say that- ostrich sized? No, 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 no but there's eggs. some big ass eggs. I'll I'll take some pictures for you sometime because we we we, we we eat a I'll lot of eggs on uh, we Ooh. buy a, what do we buy Lando Lakes eggs now mostly at, uh, at BJ's? Lando Lakes cage free I get at BJ's at Publix I buy the Eggland's best cage free eggs mm. uh, and and they're perfectly acceptable and you know I recently tweeted a picture of some scrambled eggs I made oh, that I saw that that was delightful. Yeah, somebody tagged Dagan in it and told him to rate my eggs, uh, but I don't think he replied. Dagan, did you see, see the scrambled eggs I made the other day? Oh, I did see that. Yeah. Man, I was too was a rating. to comment. I'm telling yeah, you, like, <laughs> what does she do? Oh, how do you want I your can't. eggs? Like carbon? No, no, they're golden brown. <laughs> they're golden brown, a little crispy, a little crispy on the edges. Oh, boy. You crisp your oh, eggs? Dude, you know, she well, like is a fried egg, especially you want crispy, but oh, like a God. nice scrambled egg, you get that little crisp on the outside. I'm, I'm, the guys, know? guys, I'm looking at a picture of Eggland's best cage free large brown eggs, and they look like fucking eggs. Yeah, no, those are large. You got to look up the extra large. Oh my god, you got to put them all together. Eggland's extra large eggs. <laughs> There's so much egg in this Google search. Eggland extra large. Okay, no, I did extra large eggs. Well, they don't have an extra large cage free. That's the reason why cage free eggs are generally a little bit smaller because they it's a whole thing where they're just selling one size. Like so sometimes you get a small egg in the carton and you're like, this is not a large egg, but they're just throwing them all in there because they're not going to sell cage free small eggs. I guess to me, just eggs are so utilitarian in their purpose. Like I I don't really I wouldn't say that I like I wouldn't say that I'm like, mm, I'm fiending for eggs or like I oh. crave the taste of yeah. eggs. But this eggs this like, man doesn't get it. <laughs> they're just there Not to Chris, keep you alive. No. <laughs> Chris, I have woken yeah. up with a with a fierce need, a mighty need for a boiled egg. It, All right. Really? A nice boiled? boiled egg. Oh, it seems you know, so basic. Egg, How colonial. And salt and pepper. Oh, my God. There's nothing <laughs> like it. Like I, I wake up. With just a, a strong desire were, for a fried egg. If you were to compile a list of your favorite foods, yeah, so even just top five, mm. would 
an egg be on there? Like ingredients? If it's top five, you're giving no, no. me top five. I think eggs got to be. I mean, I eat eggs almost every single no, 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 day no, no. of eggs my are life. A good, uh, you said, eggs are a good ingredient for something. Mm-hmm. Like it's a top tier ingredient. Essential, yeah. But like as like an item, like. I mean. Chris, do you know what my favorite food is? Because this is why you're gonna, this is why you don't understand. No, mashed potatoes <laughs> is my all time favorite food. So if we're talking favorite foods, you better believe that a fried egg would There's make no. the top five. I mean, if I'm thinking about wow. it, you got yeah, mashed potatoes. I'm probably gonna go with pizza at number two, you know, and then three, four, five. Any of those could be an egg. Really? I mean, any okay. of those. There's the, yeah, there's no conversation to be had here. Yeah, I just. <laughs> Pizza losing to mashed potatoes is fucking crazy, but God bless. Mashed potatoes are the best food in the world. They can be a little lumpy. They can have skins in them. Mashed potatoes all are right. all wonderful, but yeah. <laughs> they're not, look, Dagan, uh, uh, luxuries. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah, Dagan, we haven't, heard, we haven't heard from you. By the way, why are you dressed like this? You look great. I don't, no, no reason. No reason. Yeah, I thought I he was wearing I'm an unemployed. Ascot. This is, I think if I was gainfully employed right now, I wouldn't want to dress like that. I think this is my way of making it's compensating. Yeah, you right? feel you feel like uh, it's it's like when you get dressed, even though you know you're not leaving the house. Yeah, or it's exactly. just like oh, I feel like I'm doing something. <laughs> yeah, look good, yeah. feel good. Make exactly make a little progress. Like normally when I'm working at like a studio gig or I'm on a contract for a series or something, and there was that weekly Zoom call, especially if they're going to be higher ups, like if my creative director was going to be in the meeting, then I would dress like this. You know, even in a remote setting, it was like, all right, the one a week, th- once a week, I wouldn't be wearing a t-shirt. If it was just a Zoom call with my team, if it was like the larger team. Did you, you ever know, do a, did you ever do like a Squidward thing where, where it's, you, you're just, you're just <laughs> dressed up from the top and. I think about that all the time. Like, cause sometimes you got to get up. The kids accidentally walk in or the dogs wants to get out, you know, so they're going to see me from the waist down. Hanging dog. Right. Now, <laughs> so you can't just do the boxer shorts thing, but then you're, you know, you're in a pinch. It's nine fifty nine. There's a ten o'clock meeting. I'm, I guess I'm doing this in my boxer shorts. Don't get up. You know, no, yeah, yeah. it's amazing Jeffrey how many Tubin. things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't go wrong though. Like it's amazing. You would think there would be all kinds of calamities with this, but you don't hear that much of like gaffes with Zoom calls and stuff. You see it every so often, but you think so much could go wrong now with what people are wearing, what they're doing, what's going on in the background, what they have open on their computer screen. You know, oh, yeah. I mean? like so many things could go wrong. They usually don't. But I think Jeffrey Tubin set the bar so low yeah. that really what could go wrong? So what long as you're worse? not, you know, jaking off during the Zoom call, really what else could you do to offend these people? How did he... That is incredible. How is he me. still... He was on the fucking election coverage for Michigan on Tuesday. I saw him. When I was flipping well, through we the got over it. It's I just forgot all about him, honestly. Oh, I, I, I would think about that every time I saw that dude. And I do. I, I, I bet he thinks about it every single day. I, 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 oh I, I don't God. think I don't think he's like, ooh, he's whistling down the street like, oh, I got my job back. I, I think he understands that everybody he knows understand that Louis C.K. has a great bit about that. Where like, have you ever seen that that Louis C.K. bit where he's talking about how like you're so lucky that nobody knows your thing. Because everybody <laughs> knows my thing. Barack Obama knows my thing. <laughs> that is yeah, like, how do you oh, live it down? Man. You can't. Yeah, you can't. It's impossible. It. It's, it's just always going to be there. It's going to be like the first piece of information that anybody knows about you if, they, if they've even remotely heard about you. So it's, yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's something about this. that was crazy, but there's something about that that kind of that warms my heart a little bit. You know, there's something like this, like that speaks to like some level of forgiveness that I feel like maybe yeah, we should humanity. extend. We should extend a little bit, a little bit more graciously to certain people and maybe less to certain others. But mm-hmm. that's another conversation. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't I don't dis, I don't disagree, actually. It's uh, it was just surprising because you in, from my opinion, it's like, what do you benefit from having this person around based right. on the drama he brings you, regardless of how you feel about him? Makes you makes you feel like right. he knows where the bodies are buried. <laughs> Yeah, mm. that's not. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. <clears throat> Nonetheless, let me talk to you guys about luxury. Yeah, please. I have this. I really do. I apply this kind of life is short mentality to almost everything. As soon as Chris sent the email, I'm like, this is kind of the way I live my life. Like if I go to a restaurant and there's steak on the menu and there's half a chicken on the menu, 
and the steak is ten dollars more and I really want steak, I'm getting the steak. Ten times out of ten. Like yeah. that's just the way there's something so tragic to me in the idea of depriving yourself. Like we're going around once. You know what I mean? Like just I'll find a way to pay for it. Whether times are a little tighter or things are popping. I tr- I really try to live that way. Like I really try to like, and it's not to the degree of you gotta introduce some limits, right? I'm not out buying Rolexes and Bentleys and yeah. A closet full of Brooks Brothers tailored suits, yeah. right? But when I go to the grocery store, like that's my thing. Like virtually anything from the supermarket would fit under that category of just buy the things that you want, even if it costs a couple of dollars more. You want the Dave's Killer bread? You really enjoy oh, that? It's really Get good the Dave's bread. Killer. It's so good. It is good. And that's the thing. Like the things you put in your body, the things you put on your body, laundry detergent, um, whatever uh, toilet paper, deodorant, like just get the stuff that you want. Like anything under that ceiling in the supermarket, it's like, why just find a way to pay for it? If I have to work a little harder, then that's what I'll do, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, so it's, there's just something so sad, like breaks my heart about having to buy like no frills or, yeah. Oh, this loaf of bread is two dollars extra, two dollars less. I'm gonna, just, I'll just go with the Stedman's bread instead of the Dave's Killer. <laughs> like what? Like you know what I mean? Like there's just something inherently tragic in that for me. And the other thing, Chris was talking about driving. I will say I like to drive. People know I like cars, but the one thing about cars, not necessarily a brand name thing, but all time all wheel drive for a car, I will never go back. Oh, yeah. And I'm not talking about old school SUV, Jeep. I pop it into four wheel drive when we go to the beach. I'm talking about the car is driven by all four wheels. There's something so beautifully inherent, like smooth about driving an all wheel drive car that once I went there, it's like, I don't think I'll ever go back. I'll always pay the extra for all time all wheel drive. It's not just the handling, it's something about. Just being able to get up to speed, the cars being pushed and pulled, like it's just a great feeling. I remember when I was a kid, I went for a test drive of a car. I, I knew I couldn't afford it. I was in my 20s. I went to the Volkswagen dealership and the Volkswagen R32 just came out, which was like, it was like their high-end Golf. It was like an overpowered Volkswagen Golf, mm. all-wheel drive, kind of an Audi with, it's kind of an Audi with Volkswagen badges. And the car, I remember at the time, was like 35 grand or something. It was like an enormous amount of money for me. And I went to the dealership to test drive it. And I think it was like a special anniversary edition. I really wanted it, but I knew I couldn't afford it. And I I took this thing for a test drive and I was like, holy shit. It was the first time I drove an all-wheel drive car. And it was small and maneuverable and light and super, super overpowered for a car that tiny. And I, from that moment on, I was like, I knew I couldn't afford it then, but I was like, I solemnly swear I'm going to buy an all-wheel drive car, whether it's just Volkswagen or an Audi or whatever. And I was fortunate enough to, you know, eventually get there. And then Helene fell into the Subaru groove at the same time. And her all-wheel drive car, she's on her second Subaru. And there's just something special about driving the all-wheel drive cars, whether it's a little Subaru or a big SUV. There's just something about that that I know it'll be hard for me to go back to just like a standard front wheel drive car. I love Japanese front wheel drive cars, but there's just something about those four wheels, man. Like, and again, it doesn't have to be a brand name. I don't even care. Like Audi Quattro is a great four wheel drive system, but there's just something if you're a driver. I mean, I'm a I'm a parent living in the suburbs. It's kind of hard to get around driving anyway. Even if I didn't want to drive, I would have to. Yeah. But since I love driving, you know. All wheel drive, baby. I think that's the one thing. It's almost like my air conditioning. It's like if I'm going to be in the car, if I got to shuttle the kids around, I want to do it to my own standards. Yeah. So give me the all wheel drive. That doesn't have to be Rolls Royce, but you know, just give me the all wheel drive. That's enough. That makes sense. I, I think cars yeah. are a, a reasonable kind of. I, I, I don't know. T, t, car, I have a complicated relationship with cars because I like driving, not necessarily for the drive itself, but I like having my own space where I can like blast music and it's not a problem. Like I, I will have like the the music loud, so fucking loud, it's it's obnoxious. <laughs> and then I remember I, my mom called me one day. She's like, I almost had a heart attack because I went to start your car, <laughs> and it blasted this fucking. Oh, I, I think God. it blasted like misfits at her, which is like it's like oh my god, I'm so sorry. 
but I, I I like driving. I like that freedom. I like blasting the air with like the window down. That thing that is just like really dumb to do, but it feels really good to do. But like I resent the fact that it is so necessary to have one. Mm. I wish it. I wish it was more of a choice. I guess as opposed to like this deep necessity, especially in Los Angeles. Like, like you kind of. Like you could, I guess, Uber, but like it gets fucking crazy. So like oh, yeah. you, you really knows. do need a car out here, which is extra frustrating having grow, grown up in New York City because I remember just assuming this is what cities were when I was a kid because it was just where I grew up. I was like, oh, cities are all like this. They're like extra convenient and you can get anywhere from anywhere because of course you would. It makes sense. And then you come out here and you're like, oh, I live five minutes away, but it's going to take me eight hours to get there. And it's like, well, I'm not, I have friends who live geographically really close to me that I never see specifically because it's like, I'm not, you live three hours away. That's so hard. It's ridiculous. That really is tough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well said, man. I mean, yeah. And no real dependable public transportation. It's re- you got to, re- like you said, you really have to have your own wheels. Yeah. yeah the it subway nice. system there is so strange. <laughs> It's horrible. Yeah. I, I just, I, I, I like cars. I just wish they were more of a, I wish they were more of an enthusiast thing, like something that you didn't necessarily need to just function. Cause it is this, it is this hidden cost of living that is just kind of like foisted upon the, the public in, in some way. And it's just like, Oh, Hey, here's this, here's this really expensive thing that immediately depreciates in value forever, by the way. And it's like, okay, cool. Also, and you have to maintain and, insurance yeah, and, and gas and insurance and, and maintenance and oil changes and tire rotations and all this shit. And it's like, holy Absolutely, fuck, what, this is like a, who needs a child? <laughs> I got this fucking. If I didn't love it, I would be really frustrated. Right, so I yeah. get people's, yeah, I get that. You know, yeah, for and sure. And without a car, you can't stick your tongue out in front of the vent when it's on full blast. You know, that thing where you dry it out and then you put your tongue back in your mouth and it's all dry. Mm. You know, you need a car to do that. Or you need Wait, a wall unit. Is that what dogs AC. are doing? Is that what That's they're what doing I'm with doing. their heads out that window? I, I, I can't begin to understand what's in the, the mind of a canine, but it's what I'm doing if I see a wall <laughs> unit AC or a vent in a car. You, that, you, that's, that's what I'm doing. You, dr- you dry your tongue out, you're saying? Oh, yeah, you stick your tongue out. It's right in front of the vent when it's sit, on full blast, and you let her dry out, and then you put your tongue back in your mouth. Oh, it's so good. All right. I, <laughs> I don't even know where to go. Uh, I've satiated. Cool. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm ready to uh, move on as well. That was an interesting story yes. you just told us. There, Mike, there's a All right, very well. Let's, uh, Michael, let's go to you, though, and hear from you next. All right. Yeah. So my topic, which has been kicking around in my mind for a while as I use Reddit more and more, um, I really never used Reddit before I worked here and had to like moderate the community. It baffles my mind how willing people are to just look so dumb writing in their queries to strangers, you know, instead of Googling it, you know, seeing write ins on like the baking subreddit that's like, can I replace the white flour with wheat flour? Can, you know, can I replace all the sugar with Splenda? And it's like, can you fucking Google it? You know, can you like, why are you willing to write this on a public forum and wait hours or maybe days to get an answer versus Google existing? And you could have just asked and got an answer in three seconds. But I also realized like, as a child, I loved the newspaper advice columns like Dear Abby. Um, I think Ask Prudence is the other one. You know, there's a lot of these. But it's like this has been a thing for a very long time. People writing to a complete stranger who has no context of your situation and asking them for advice. And it, it just boggles my mind because I'm just... I don't know, really independent, I suppose. I'm like, I'm a 30-year-old adult. I'm not going to ask a bunch of strangers, what should I do? My husband's mad at me. What should I do? It's like, (laughs) Jesus Christ, go talk to him. Like, for fuck's sake, why do you need help with this? What's wrong with you? And there's myriads of them. I mean, I've read it. Am I the asshole? All these different, you know, forums, the DIY forum, people asking the dumbest question you've ever seen. And it's like, Jesus Christ, like either Google it or go to a hardware store. It's just it it boggles my mind. But 
I sort of wanted to ask what are if you we are the type of people to seek out our own answers or the ones who are asking strangers for their advice. Like the one time I posted on Reddit asking for help, it was the most useless thing in the world. It was when Rush was really sick and the vet was zero help. I was looking at all these like forums online. I couldn't find anything that matched what was wrong with our dog. So I posted on Reddit with details of like what food made him sick, what we've tried, all the medications we've given him. And the responses were just completely useless. People telling me to try the food that I said made him sick. People telling me to try the medication that I said made him sick. It's like they didn't even read the post. They're just responding with the first thing that came to their mind. And I was like, this is useless. (laughs) And just realizing that not only are the people asking for advice helpless, but the people giving the advice are equally as helpless as well. Uh, So I wanted to just kind of pose this to you guys as how do we view these online forums and even our own shows with the write-ins now usually are funny. And I think most of our listeners know that they're writing in with a funny problem that they don't necessarily need help with. The guy who his neighbor kept asking to use his lawnmower, he saw the humor in that. He knew that was a funny write-in. I don't think that man actually needed our help. And that's kind of the difference of what I see for our write-ins. I don't really think these people are asking us for genuine help more so as they know they're living in a funny scenario and someone else would find humor in it. Uh, but I want, I want to start with you, Colin, both on, on the side of our write-ins and in forums. I mean, you used to write the game guides, which you know are essential for a lot of us getting through JRPGs and such. And then on the flip side, with all these guides out there, you still see people posting single questions like, what level do I need to be to beat this boss? <laughs> and it's like, there's 10 fucking guides for this game. Like... Yeah. You could have found an answer in seconds. <clears throat> I mean, one of the things you're speaking to is something that made me was a major driving force behind me just kind of not wanting to really socially be on these social media apps anymore like and using them is because people there are just there are more people that don't understand how to read than I think you than you would <laughs> yeah. than you think. Like uh, and I don't mean that to be rude it's just it's obvious and a lot of it comes from reading some of our our listeners inquiries although i make fun of our listeners a lot worse than they really are but like some of them i'm like jesus christ dude um (laughs) but it 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 goes into the just just this general as you said with the, the post on reddit with rush like this general kind of unwillingness to read fully and almost being proud of not reading and not understanding things and not having an attention span and all that kind of stuff. What I find funny, though, this is kind of like a take a penny, leave a penny situation, though, because I ask Google questions all the time. And someone else asked the question on my behalf and I read the answer to their question. So like someone jumped on the grenade. It could have been me, but it never was. And maybe yeah. some at some point I should leave the penny. However, maybe the walkthroughs and the guides I, I wrote when I was a kid were kind of leaving the pennies like people are still using my Zelda guides, for instance, today. I go on Game Facts every once in a while and look at the traffic. It's crazy. It's like I wrote these when I was in 11th grade, you know, um, and so maybe I've already left my a sufficient number of pennies, but I don't judge people wondering those things. I just yeah, I judge people asking redundant questions. It bothers me a lot, actually, on a website that I use often PSN profiles. They have a great community of people that are trophy hunters and a really good forum system as well. But you see people leaving these forum posts sometimes where it's like, dude, there is already a post about this or this is already in the guide or something like why wouldn't why wouldn't you want to better ingratiate yourself to a community than to have done the legwork to make it seem like you give a shit about people's time? That's a a bigger thing for me. But as far as I don't know, the the problems we get we get messaged about are sometimes serious, but yet are usually not. Sometimes the outcomes are more serious than we expect. People pass away or um didn't that one guy leave his wife over something? Remember that? Oh, you were telling me about that. I don't, I don't remember exactly. It was something like I, that, right? I have, I have a like, vague memory of that. Like yeah. something we said inspired him to leave his wife. And I'm like, what? And he was dead <laughs> ass yeah, serious. Do it on that show. <laughs> I mean, all right. It's like, that's unintentional power because that's not what I'm trying to get anyone to do when they come listen to our Sacred Symbols podcast. Well, I mean, well, he had, to a, be he fair. had an epiphany, I guess, you know? Like, Look, man, to be fair, like, whatever, have your epiphany. But uh, that, that's, a good, that's a good situation for everybody involved, I think. 
because if, because if, let's, because for, for real, like if a podcast is going to convince you to leave your wife, like you probably, you probably should have gotten out of there earlier. You know, mm-hmm. like that's, that's, you were halfway out the door. Yeah. You were, yeah. True. Yeah. It's just like, I, I just need Colin Moriarty to tell me it's okay. Yeah. Just, if just <laughs> like, Colin could say it's okay. Then, so yeah. it's funny though, the, the, Advice column and kind of anonymous answering of things is is old, really old. Yeah. And I was reading Walter Isaacson's Benjamin Franklin biography a few months ago, as you know, and he he did that even like he he I think he played the part of like some woman, some like random widowed woman in some letters that were written in like a newspaper in Philadelphia. <clears throat> so I love that kind of shit of people always just sometimes it's not a will thing. Sometimes you just need to know that other people are going to tell you what you need to hear. So it feels okay to hear it. Like, I think a lot of it is self-reinforcing when someone sends something to like fucking dear Abby or whatever, they probably have an expectation of what they think they should hear back. And if they do hear that back, that's probably just a reinforcing agent. They probably don't even really need to be told it. Just know that they're not the only ones that feel that way. But, uh, I don't know that what's that Reddit that you read that you tell me about with the recipes oh i didn't have eggs yeah there's a there's an amazing subreddit micah turned me on to i haven't actually read it but she tells me stories from it about people complaining like it's a compilation of people complaining on different recipe and cooking websites about how their shit didn't turn out because they didn't use the ingredients listed so like they replaced something with this or replaced something with that or did this instead and they're like and it didn't turn out and it's like just a collection of this (laughs) stuff it's like dude this is the kind of stuff you're dealing with there's a lot of dumb fuckers out there, dude. Like, <laughs> seriously, because you have to be dumb as fuck to bake something, bake something, and then be like, oh, I'm going to use this instead of this, and then I think it's going to come out right. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And then you, and then you, re- it's like when I watch public freakout videos, and it's always a little, it's a surprising subgenre of people posting their own freakouts, like thinking they look good, but they don't. It's the same kind of thing here. It's like then you go and you reinforce the stupidity by asking about it and bringing attention to the fact that you replace sugar with flour. Yeah, but isn't the <laughs> cooking thing heroic in some way though? Because you're kind of going, you're going out there and do conducting the experiment and then sort of reporting back with whether it worked or not. And if it didn't, then you don't, you listen. Don't make this mistake, the same mistake I made. Uh, I just feel yeah, like I just feel like you, be, but it's go ahead, Michael. I was the biggest thing is these people always give it like one star. They'll be like one star. I replaced the flour with almond flour and it didn't work. And it's like, well, this wasn't a gluten free recipe. You should buy gluten free one to one replacement. You you know, but they'll give you a big one star. And it's like, well, you didn't. You fucked it up. (laughs) And then you gave the poor recipe writer one star. That's yeah. That's (laughs) I replaced the flour with white phosphorus and it didn't work. (laughs) <laughs> it's um yeah yeah I, I also just think that like the the baking stuff it's like yeah if you're figuring it out i feel like we figured out how to bake things in mesopotamia so i think we know i think we have a, a general idea how it works at this point so people probably shouldn't shouldn't be messing too deeply with those at this at this point in my opinion um yeah but that's that's where i, I stand on that my dear yeah. All mm. right. Well, yeah, Chris, you know, we're about the same age here. Yeah. So I'm curious how you feel, because some of these forum posts on Reddit are clearly old people. Like you can tell by how it's written. Sometimes this is an old person who does not understand Google. They figured out Reddit somehow. But you can tell sometimes like this is an older person who is either just overwhelmed by Google, like they get 100 results and they're like, I just want to get like 10 answers from real people. Or it is someone young and i'm just surprised at their at their willingness to wait you know hours to get a reply on very basic questions like where are you on using forums like this yeah i i i have never i don't think i've really asked a question on any forum like that i've never written into like a a subreddit asking for advice on anything i think the closest thing every now and again on twitter and it's a very rare occurrence i'll run into some tech issue whether it be like with like a software or something and I, I look through like forums and i can't find answers and i'm like do any of my editor friends know what the fuck's going on here like what what is what is what is this or even um, most recently i think i had a, a thing where i asked on twitter it's like is alan wake 2 broken because i was trying to get the platinum for alan wake 2 and it turns out that it was they patched it but it was like way too late it was just like all right i'm, I'm done with this oh, that's, that's... i'm like 97 percent of the way through but then like they did patch it but like the issue would have made i would have to had played it again 
and I already played it like twice. I'm like, ah, oh, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to spend 10 more hours just to get this one collectible. Like I'm just not, I'm not doing it, but like there was no information about it because it was like very, very new. So I was like, I had to like ask, uh, but I don't know. I don't necessarily have a problem with that, with the premise of asking strangers for help or like not even necessarily help, but just a, an alternate perspective, because I do think sometimes an outside perspective is very necessary um, because like you can ask, I don't know, I, I've asked friends for advice and they, they, not that they give bad advice, but they're also like so close to me and th- any given situation that it's always in my mind. There's always like a, a something in my mind where it's like, I think I need like a, an impartial party, even if it's not necessarily yeah. like a, a qualified party or like some like like a therapist or something. So I'll Google a question that I might be having. And then usually there's like a million examples of people asking a similar question and I'll sift through the responses and I'll take them into consideration for sure. But like, I don't know if I've ever like exclusively relied on it or participated in it in a direct way. I do think, I I do think outside perspectives are valuable. I, I think the first thing that comes into mind when I think about this stuff is like hoarders. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like when, when, like you just see somebody who's just like, yeah, I'm living in squalor and like whatever. It's crazy. It, I love that show, it, dude. That's one of my favorites. Takes, yeah. It's so. Good. But it takes like some complete stranger coming into your house, being like, "Hey, you're, you're broken. <laughs> you're writhing around in shit, and that's probably not great." <laughs> yeah, you can't flush your toilet anymore. Yeah, that's there's that's a, why there's like, diapers in the corner. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's why I think I don't know. This is a little bit off topic, but it it, it extends to kind of how like I, I I have this this feeling sometimes when I with uh, like politically speaking, even like when when people from outside of the country talk about our country, I'm actually like fascinated by it because I actually think it's somewhat more valuable than people who are like here and are kind of like inherently just kind of like accustomed to everything. I think you do need sometimes like an outside perspective to be like, oh, this is kind of crazy, actually, what you're doing. (laughs) And it's not even necessarily that like that person is inherently better. It's just that they are so fresh and unencumbered by any preconceived notion or any or any previous bias that like they come into your situation and you're like, hey, you're oh, wow, you have eight dead cats under your couch and you didn't realize (laughs) that was a problem. How? (laughs) And then you're like, oh, yeah, maybe I probably should have paid attention to that. So like I, I, generally speaking, I'm I'm for the the like the general idea of like anonymous like p- people feeling like they can be comfortable enough to ask questions about embarrassing things that some of us might be too embarrassed to ask because I've definitely googled shit that's like kind of embarrassing like a hundred percent oh yeah like no I googled very recently why does my fart smell like my dog's fart because I was a little concerned as right. to they smelled identical <laughs> identical. Like it was, it was like, am I ingesting the dog food by some? Like, what happened? Like, it smelled identical. Are you? But or now are it just happens all. Food? It happens right. all. They don't yeah. eat human food, so, 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 but it happens all the time. <laughs> I think we just spend a lot of time together. We're very close, so yeah, they're very special. Oh man, is that what it said? No, uh, Google <laughs> didn't really have an answer for me. So this but that's the thing is that you would have been the first you you are not the first person to ask that question. No. And if you had if you had publicly asked that question, even anonymously, you would have been a hero to probably hundreds of other people. You're doing a service for, for doing that service. That's kind of yeah. what I that's I feel I, I, I like that there's an anonymity to it. it. It kind of allows people to just be vulnerably human and vulnerably ignorant uh, and just kind of pull from the wealth of you know, all of human knowledge for some kind of semblance of a path forward. Even if a lot of that stuff is kind of dumb and useless, sometimes a lot of, a lot of those forums end up being completely like purposeless and not really all that interesting. But the fact that that's a resource that's available to us is like probably like the, in some ways it feels like the last part of online culture that doesn't feel inherently cynical or like, I, I don't know. There's, there's there's just something unabashedly like human about it, about asking really dumb, embarrassing <laughs> questions like how long, like how pink should the ch- how pink should the chicken be? You know, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, not, I I, ideally that. not, ideally not at all. But <laughs> Google, how pink should my bussy be? <laughs> oh, my oh. God. <laughs> Uh. no but chris you do bring up an interesting (laughs) facet of this because when you mentioned hoarders for example 
these people who their families have clearly told them that their house is a problem. But to them, they're like, well, of course, my bitch sister would say that. You know, yeah. it's really like if the if you don't like the person who's telling you that something is wrong, you're so you know less likely to listen to them versus, yeah, these people who write on Reddit like, oh, I, I dunked my sister's dress in the toilet. Am I the asshole? Yes. And everyone's like, of course you are. And they're like, well, she doesn't like me very much. So I figured she was just overreacting, you know, like these people who are willing to think that their family just has it out for them it's, versus having valid criticism. I do. I, I do think there's an element of closeness that kind of uh, hinders. I don't know. It, it's strange. Um when you know people, even if even if you don't like dislike them at all, it's just like there's an inherent like, well, you know me very well and that's valuable. But there's also you are close to this situation in such a way that like if any even if even if it's not a particularly volatile situation, like things stand to change in some way and you're there to witness it and you, you're a part of it technically. So like it, sometimes it does take like a you know, Gordon Ramsay coming into your kitchen and being like, what the fuck is all this mold doing here? <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking raw. <laughs> like, you know, you need you need that sometimes. Uh, and I think, I don't know, it's, it's a valuable utility, I think, even if it's, you know, it's largely, there's a lot of dumb shit on there. Yeah, yeah, no, that definitely changes my perspective on it a little bit, uh, even as I am continually just awed at what I see people do. There was a recipe. This happens a lot. And it's a big joke. Uh, people who replace apple cider with apple cider vinegar. And they'll be like, <laughs> oh this tastes God. like vinegar. It's terrible. And it's like, I'm like, read, read. <laughs> and if you've never heard of apple cider, by some miracle, if you've never heard of apple cider, wouldn't you just Google it first? Or wouldn't you just, because the, the recipe was for, I think it was for like mold wine. And so it was it was on like an apple cider sangria. Uh -huh. And the lady the recipe was like two cups of apple cider and like a, a two cups of wine and some other stuff. Wouldn't you think that drinking two cups of apple cider vinegar would be fucking terrible? Wouldn't you just have a thought See, that, that wow, sounds that like sounds bad. That sounds like a bit to me. You it happens I mean? so like, often on like the people forum. Doing comedy. <laughs> Like it'll think? be anything apple cider, it'll be apple cider cake, apple cider donuts. The number of people who buy apple cider vinegar and don't even question that two cups of it sounds like a lot. It, and it just oh, like boggles man. my mind. I, I I never hardly answer people's question on the baking forum because it's literally like this isn't worth my time. You know, you, uh, <laughs> sometimes people have genuinely good questions. And then those are worth answering. But the person who's like, I took out all the sugar and these muffins taste like shit. And it's like, you deserve them. You deserve the shit muffins. If you thought taking all Dude, the sugar out you, wouldn't make them taste good. You just made me so hungry for an apple cider donut. I can't even tell you. Like, I haven't had one of those in so long. Oh, my God. Yeah. And now I really so want good. one. And I'm mad because I have no access to it. <laughs> See, I'm going to start with this, but that sounds to me like someone taking a piss in those forums. Do you guys ever see the YouTuber that goes into random Zoom calls and like whether it's a music class or a yoga thing oh, or too a mad? dance, he just kind of invades it? No. Are you talking Did about you the, see that? Is that what it's called? What is it called? Are, are you talking about too mad? The He's like a black guy with like glasses? No, it's oh. not. I have, I'm going to write that one down. I've never seen that. No, one. don't worry. I'm he's sure dead. Multiple people do this. Oh, they just hijack <laughs> different Zoom calls and like just act, behave badly. Right? right. That type of thing. That's what it sounds like is going on here. Like somebody's just kind of invading and being like, oh, like, you know, acting like a jackass. It sounds like it sounds like the Reddit's getting punked to me. You know, I don't we know do. if that's just Dagster energy or what. Well, but like, there's no such thing as Dagster energy, dude. <laughs> there is. No, no, it <laughs> exists. It exists. We do have on the forum satire Saturday for the posts that are clearly satire, but they're because like you just you just can tell. But when people do write in, and and they're just like, I can't have salt. You know, can I make? And it'll be like something stupid. And it's like, can I make this without salt? And it's like, I guess, but it's gonna taste like shit. You know, just it's just not worth it. Now, also, dig, and I gotta tell you, I keep thinking that you, I thought you were eating a carrot, like a Bugs Bunny carrot over here. If oh, you're watching my, uh, the video, Dagan has like an it? orange marker, my, yeah, and my I kept shark. getting glimpse of it. I thought you were like nibbling on a carrot, like a Bugs Bunny style <laughs> mm, carrot. It actually, and then I realized like it was a pen. <laughs> 
I'm going to change the blue. I'll Bugs change the Bunny, blue that looks less like a carrot. Bugs Bunny. I, I learned something recently about Bugs Bunny that kind of distressed me. Please. And it's it's the fact that he's completely he's he's literally just a pop culture reference that is just aged out of relevance and nobody knows what like nobody alive today understands what he's a reference to yeah and i had no i had no fucking idea that that was true at all <laughs> like i really thought bugs bunny was just like his own like character that somebody like invented and not like an impersonation of some he's like an impersonation of some clark gable character yeah or like something 1930s from me. 40s hollywood yeah and that's why he's nibbling on a carrot because i guess that happens in that movie <laughs> and because, i had no idea because i thought about that because like rabbits don't eat carrots like they can i guess you could give it one a carrot and it'll eat it but you could give a rabbit fucking nearly anything that's interesting i didn't know anything about this it, tell me more it, say more that i mean that's that's it he's he's, just, he's a reference he's like a pop culture reference to this fucking clark gable character that when he was when clark gable died and he lost all of his relevance all that was left was bugs buddy and everybody just assumed that that was an original character is that yeah. funny is that i mean that, that's distressing to me yeah. i don't like that it, that's fascinating well I very recently learned that uh, on all that, I think, is it Ross Perot, like the really rich guy that ran for president? Mm -hmm. And on all that, Ross Perot is a character played by a girl, I think, uh, with the big ears and all the money bags. And I thought as a, as a child watching all that, I thought Ross Perot was just a joke. And then recently oh. I heard someone say it and I was like, that's a real person. Oh, really? That's a real guy. Like I thought this was just a joke on all that. The guy with the big ears and his desk is covered in money. And I was like, <laughs> and, but the, it, that was just a matter of age of at the time that I was watching that show, I didn't know who was running for president and I didn't know any of the stuff that was going on. And yeah, then as not. an adult, I carried that memory with me of the funny big eared man thinking that's just that's just a joke. And finding yeah. out he was a real person was almost a little like upsetting. Like, wait a minute. That was yeah. the whole joke the whole time is that he was real. It's like the <laughs> like, energy. That was bizarre. It's, it's, it's the energy of somebody dying, but not quite like there's something about it where it's just like, oh, oh, he's like not original. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it's a little disappointing because it's been literally so many generations, like every generation represented right here in this on this podcast it was already way it was all of these references were already way irrelevant from like the 60s like it was already way it, everything not only bugs bunny but all the old wb cartoons generally yeah everything just all the humor went over our heads because we didn't know what it was lampooning we didn't know what it was satirizing at all it was it's it's completely the fact that it was warner brothers a giant hollywood entertainment conglomerate with their tentacles in the big and small screen, like all media. And it, the fact that it was just sheep to play for decades. Yeah. And that it was completely irrelevant and that it was beautifully drawn and beautifully animated. Now is enough to sustain it. But we didn't get what the hell it was poking fun at at all. <laughs> just, yeah, that's what? weird. I love that. I love that every time I'm on a show with Dagan, we just inevitably like drift into animation. <laughs> just like, even if it's not really like, you started that, it but that actually did just come up organic like i sincerely like I, bugs like that was mentioned it's so you funny know? man it's so crazy you know what you guys you guys this is weird this is a weird memory for me and it's inexplicable it makes no sense but i'll take you back to the analog advice days and micah mentioned this actually so 1990 maybe 15 year old Dagster. Soft, sophomore in high school, right? Dakes, yeah. My sort of routine, I had this ritual. I would come home from high school every day of the week and somewhere between getting home and going out skateboarding inevitably, I would make myself a snack. I would grab the daily newspaper, which was on our kitchen table that our dad left there the morning, you know, in the morning. New York Newsday, Long Island's paper. And I would open it, I would sit down with my snack, and I would open it right to the advice columns. Dear Abby and Ann Landers at the time. I don't know why. It was all about, like, why was a 15-year-old kid reading about, like, marital advice, <laughs> that's, dinner that's, parties. That's really strange. strange from my in-laws. Like, oh. I don't know what I loved about yeah, it, but I would... I loved it so much. I, lo I, I, like, really enjoyed it. I didn't understand any of it, but I would read that before I even hit the funny pages, which means a lot because Calvin and Hobbes was still running back then. So before I even open it up to the comic strips, 
I always read Dear Abby and Ann Landers. And I think it was kind of like reading a foreign language. Like there was no way a 15 year old kid no, it's who insane. just wanted to skateboard had any context to anything that was going on in that column. <laughs> but it was, you know what? It was almost like a hoarder's thing. It was almost like reading about other people's problems and being entertained by it. Schadenfreude? Something, yeah. It's like, oh, like I feel depressed or somebody bullied me in the, in the cafeteria, but then you come home and you read, oh, this, uh, this person has real problems. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, disabuses like you, it disabuses you of the notion that anything you're going through at 15 is anything worth yeah, it. Like, <laughs> I love it. You automatically the puts idea, it in context. The idea of right, 15 right. year old you eating a snack and popping open a newspaper to read Ann Landers every day is fucking mesmerizing. That, that, that's like. <laughs> It made that's no like, sense. That's like a kid authentically playing with action figures, like authentically, like putting his whole animation into it and then like going outside to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Did you not read the newspaper as a Christian? As a child, Chris? As a Christian? <laughs> as, a, as a Christian child? <laughs> no, I, I, I think I pretended to. Like, I think oh. I, I think I like popped it open just to see like, what's this about? And then I would see like socks and I'd be like, I don't know what this is. And then I put it away forever. I just, I liked the aesthetics of the newspaper more than I liked the newspaper itself. I just, I was not, I couldn't care less about like what the hell was going on locally in my oh. town. Ta- like, oh, oh yeah, no. there's. You didn't check the obituary, see whose grandparents died? No. Like... <laughs> <Jeez>. I did <laughs> That was I another mean, I, thing. Yeah, I loved checking the newspaper. You always, you check the police log. All right. Then you check the obituaries. You read Dear Abby. You read the comics. All right. I'm 10 years old. <laughs> like this is this is how you read the newspaper. You skip I, over the boring stuff, of course. I was so completely and utterly uncurious about those things. <laughs> like I, I, I was thinking about so many. I, I don't know. Childhood was very stressful for a lot of like internal reasons and so i think i was like very very introspective but i didn't i didn't really i was i was very much like sealed away from like anything that was like oh the news or like you know ah there's a war and it's like is there all right like i it i really paid no attention to really any anything political probably or any anything news oriented until probably like high school i think is when i started being like oh i guess i guess there's a war going on (laughs) (laughs) yeah like there was Think back to that era. It was all Operation Desert Storm and all this important shit. You know, the first World War, World Trade Center bombing, like all this crazy stuff happening in New York and all over the world. And I'm reading Ann Landers every day, like religiously, yeah. you know, five days a week at least. Like it's, have you guys seen, there's one thing that Micah's email made me think of though. That, and you guys may be familiar with this. Bill Burr does his Thursday afternoon, Monday morning podcast. And a lot of it, is just his listeners writing in for advice about their various debacles and what they're going through. And of course it's Bill Burr. So it's very funny and comedic and very tongue in cheek. And he's very, you know, he's got that whole Boston sarcastic sensibility. I love that guy. But what's cool about that podcast is he really sometimes gets very invested and he tries to give heartfelt, genuine advice. Like he really digs down and tries to help these people. And sometimes he calls his wife in Mia to help him sort of go through something and sort of give their best spin on things. But that's a really cool sort of vehicle that you get a little bit of Bill Burr if you're a fan, but you could also write in and oftentimes he really tries to help the people and he seems to care. Like he really seems invested in it, which is which is kind of neat. And it makes me think of what you're saying about the Reddit thing, Michael, like I'm not a big Reddit guy at all. But I wonder how much of this dates back to like what I think of in the late 90s and stuff with like early chat rooms. Like how much of it is just a social thing? Like, let me just jump on here. It's a way to stoke a conversation and maybe introdu- introduce yourself into a community. Even if it's silly, it's, it's, it's kind of like making conversation at a dinner party. It's like breaking the ice. It's like, let me say something silly. Some people are going to dismiss me as an idiot, but some people might sort of embrace me in conversation or just understand that I'm being funny or welcome me and stuff like that. You know what I mean? I wonder how yeah. much of it, again, I'm not familiar really with Reddit, but if I have a general interest in baking and I, I think, okay, or cars or DIY, fixing things around the house, electronics, whatever I'm into, 
I could kind of introduce myself into a community like this by just saying some saying anything, you know, and st- starting a conversation. Now, I wonder how much of it is that. Hmm. Yeah, I you can know. see that. You should you should take up baking. <laughs> You should do it. D- Dakester the baker. <laughs> yeah. You do yeah. It. And There's then we host here. a baking podcast. You know, me being a little more seasoned, Dagan as like the novice. And we go through your trials and your tribulations. You know, like this week you're going to, you're going to make like Julia Child's, you know, famous almond cake or something like that. Just something <laughs> extreme. <laughs> I'm game. Let's do it. But I'm also available. If, you know, <laughs> what do you got going on? <laughs> now the listeners have long asked for uh, the Betty Ann Moriarty, you know, cooking show. So you know what? Maybe maybe we get her and Dagan together yeah. to do yeah. that. Right? Unite the two forces. <laughs> Are you satisfied? Yeah, yeah. No, this was good. Some interesting perspectives. I want to say, if you're ever at a dinner party and you don't know what to say to somebody, you know, pull out. Some of the old classics, like how many eggs can you eat? You know, how, how many pairs of socks are you wearing? Yeah. You know, there's plenty of things you could say. I got my patented conversation starters. I also have my patented pickup lines. Girl, you got an ass like a baked apple. Works every yeah. time. <laughs> Works every time. Girl, you built like the word Mississippi. All right. So <laughs> if you need conversation starters, you need pickup lines, you know, write into me on Discord or Twitter, I suppose. That'll be our little forum and I'll help you out. Thank you know my, <laughs> all right. You know my favorite. You know my favorite line of all time, and and that has consistently worked. By the way, and I got it, it. I got it from Seinfeld. <laughs> it's you, you know you may not know it by looking at me, but I can run really fast, <laughs> 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 and it does work. It's very strange how effective it is at like an icebreaker conversation. It's weird. No, I can see that. I can see yeah. that actually working in real life. Yeah. It's just disarming enough that they weren't expecting you to say that. And right. it's also like, oh, he, oh, he's funny. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right, Dag, it's time to hear from you, my friend. Oh, okay. Fun. All right. So Dagster's I wanted up. to pose this question yeah, to you guys today. Here. <laughs> time to hear from just you. Just embrace it. I ref- you guys are ruining everything with this shit. Like the, the verbiage you're so, like when you started calling Constellation Steli and all the uh, like you guys I'm like, come on. Steli man. is good. Oh. Steli's good. That's what Steli works. Me. Chipotle being chippers really Ta- works. Like really that's, 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 I, I, I don't co sign that. that. I don't co sign that. I don't co sign that. Yeah. I, don't know I like that one. Sneaky Rons was too much. When Dustin started calling McDonald's sneaky Rons, that was too far for me. But Chipotle <laughs> being chippers or cracker barrel, I call it the barrel. Cracker right, house. Works. You should call it the crack house. <laughs> crack house. <laughs> How do you not see that? I one? think. Yeah, I, I just think. I, I think that what ha- what is happening here, Colin, is that I think. Th- I think the. I think the Dagster terminology is taking off specifically because you are so spitefully against it. Yeah. And the yeah. only the only way to make it lose its luster is to simply. Embrace it to a nauseating degree to the point where Dagan's kind of annoyed by it. Yeah, that's a I good think. point. I know that a lot of pe- people thrive off of that stuff in our audience, so I, I do need to be more cognizant of that. That's true. Yeah, our audience has that energy for yeah, sure. No doubt. I have that energy you too. You guys see so. that sacred. Yeah. Of course. So, guys, I wanted to ask you guys today. This one's been on the list for a while, and I know where it comes from for me, but I'm genuinely curious for you guys and also for the listeners. Like you guys may have one of these two that are that are listening or watching the show. And that's the question of what's not funny to you personally. What's too taboo for you to make light of? And like I emailed these cats, like put it in the context of stand-up comedy, right? Like what could a comedian say that is just for you strikes a, a sour chord like what could could a comedian try to make a light of that doesn't click with you what crosses the line what's tough for you to have a sense of humor about what's that one thing and maybe you know which would be fascinating to me maybe you don't have one but in which case you don't know, you have to explain to me and where this comes from for me is i'm not like at all the censorship book banning type. And I really do try to embrace the philosophy, especially as somebody who pays close attention to stand-up comedy and really loves it, that in the right hands, I do think that almost anything could be a funny joke. 
even something extremely offensive. And I've seen it a million times. I think of the one Daniel Tosh routine about racism and slavery specifically that is so funny the way he, in his hands, that I'm like, that was the one thing that made me cross the line for me where it was like, you know what? I think you could make anything funny, you know, and he's not the only one. A lot of people do it, but I have this one fear. I don't talk about it a lot because I do have that sort of jinx energy where I'm, I'm afraid to talk about the things that I'm really scared of. Right. And I know where this comes from for me. And that's something that, I don't know, something that really breaks my heart, but also something that's becoming more and more, I mean, it's coming, it's becoming more and more problematic. It's becoming more and more, um, I think it's becoming more and more frequent. And that's just the whole thing of school shootings. I mean, there's just something inherently horrible for me about anything where there's innocent, you know, children being you know, killed and maimed needlessly. Like there's just something implicitly horrific about school shootings. And also I think that fear, I'm really wrapped up in that fear because my three favorite people in the world are cooped up in a school building every day. So Mm. that, that specific fear hits home for me. I have a teacher wife and two kids, one in junior high school and one in high school. So that's something. Teacher wife. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like a new show. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, some some new anime. Yeah, yeah it does that. That actually kind of clicks. Um, but that's something that re- that's a fear that really hits home for me. So, but I I gotta tell you right now, there's probably a way to spin the school shooting thing even for me in a funny way. Maybe in the, again in the right hands. But that would be the one answer for me. Was that would be a challenge for me to find funny not only in the moment after some potentially you know horrific tragedy but also just in general i i could see that making being a hard thing to make a joke about so that would be my answer that would be the real challenge if a comedian could make that funny you know that's my thing of like maybe that's as close to taboo as i would get and i just want to i want to know yours kyle you know we never start with you I'll start with you, my friend. Do you have that one thing that maybe could cross the line for you where where it would really be sort of a challenge for you to laugh at? You know, what could somebody say that potentially could you could find really offensive? I don't know. I I don't want to be like, well, nothing's offensive to me. It's like, obviously, there's a bunch of things that are offensive that are potentially offensive. But school shootings is a great example. Obviously, a horrible thing from so many levels. But I'm sure that a good comedian can make that funny like and i don't know that there's not that that had happened but something about it or some reaction to it or something about the shooter or like no doubt do i and do i believe that i could be like rolling on the ground laughing at a routine that had to do with a school shooting like that's not unimaginable to me what i know is that i'm probably not smart enough to figure out what would be funny about it but i don't want to preclude others from exploring that and putting some sort of barrier around what could or could not be funny like 9-11 jokes are often really really funny um yeah it's a good example you know when you talk yeah. about human misery i mean not to underscore school shootings but the, like the, the worst school shooting is a, a micro is like a a small piece of, of 9-11 in terms of misery right and human human loss and suffering and we have no problem i don't think laughing at that or laughing at world wars and you know, family guy tells Nazi jokes all the time. And like, it, I don't know. I, what came to mind for me, I guess, is something that I I would have a hard time believing would be funny. would be something like animal cruelty or something like that. Like I was trying to put my mind towards something where it's like, what would I really recoil from no matter what? But it's like, even then I'm sure you mm. could make it funny. I just, I get bumped. Did you guys see the John Stewart clip that was going around the other day when it, cause his dog died? Oh yeah. 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 And I watched that or whatever. And I was like, damn, dude, this is so fucking sad and depressing. I don't I don't feel like this about almost any people with like rare, you know, rare exception, probably like, you know, a small group of people in my life. It's uh, so maybe you could not get it together. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, so maybe well, something happened, to that effect would be too offensive. I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. It happened the day before he recorded that. I'm pretty sure. Right. So it's pretty, yeah. pretty fresh. It was raw. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I I don't know. I I think out maybe like for me, maybe just like personal stuff that is like specific to me. Like if someone someone were to make a joke about like the death of like a family member that was close to me, you know what I mean? Like that would that would probably I it would be very difficult for me to find that funny. But I wouldn't necessarily be like you can't do that. You know what I mean? Like it's just. But uh, if we're talking about nebulous subjects, though, like. I don't know. It's I, I mean, you bring up school shootings. I mean, I remember I remember specifically being afraid of them. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I, I feel like I, I don't know, like um, millennials are such a you, like, interestingly traumatized <laughs> gen of, like group of people because it's like 9-11 and then the economy and then like, oh, yeah, everybody oh, going to school is dangerous. And it's just like, oh, man, <laughs> it's this is wild. And I don't you think I don't, dealt with a lot. I don't think the newer generation is any better, really, with with like COVID and all that stuff, too. So mm. like, I, I think um, I don't know. I, I I don't think there's anything generally that I would consider to cross a line. I just think it it, it needs to be done well and and there needs to be a purpose to it. Um, I like edgy comedy, but like it needs, it needs to be comedy first and foremost, really. Like it's, there's a lot of lazy edginess that happens on, on the internet, especially because I think people kind of overstate the nature of, um, of uh, political correctness. I don't think it's not real, but I do think it's, it's become this kind of. Uh, almost like this kind of straw man of itself where people just feel like, oh, well, if I just shout the N word and you don't laugh, then that means like you're too sensitive. And it's just like, mm. no, that's just not a joke. It, it's like Mike, like Michael Richards freaking out at the Laugh Factory wasn't funny. I mean, it was it was funny. It's funny right. now. Right. Like, but <laughs> but it wasn't funny, though. <laughs> it, it, it was it was funny that such a thing could happen. <laughs> but like it wasn't like a good joke. It wasn't like a bit right. that worked. And it's not even necessarily that that a comedian couldn't make uh, a joke with that word funny or, or that even just like a scenario like that, but like he, j he couldn't do it and he just wasn't up to that task and he wasn't the person to be doing it. And I think ultimately when you're making jokes about really serious topics like that, I don't think anything is off the table, but you have to understand that you're kind of going in with a, you're walking into uh, a scenario that you're going to get dirty in. I, I, I liken it to kind of digging through like a dumpster looking for a diamond, you know, where it's like, I feel like a lot of people are just happy rolling around on the top of it and getting dirty without actually pulling anything useful out of it. And I think getting something useful out of it is what makes getting dirty. Okay. Like that's what justifies like, okay, I'm going to tell this obscene joke. I'm going to look like a monster for 90% of it. And then here's the punchline and it's going to hit and everybody's going to laugh. And even <laughs> if some people don't laugh, it's like, whatever, like nobody's going to find everything funny. Like that's no, there's no such thing, but you've got to come out of the, you've got to come out of the, the garbage with something because otherwise you've just kind of languished in filth for mm. no reason. Yeah. And then you're just kind of pretending like you've done something brave. When you just kind of haven't. And I, I, school shootings is a good example. Like I, I've because, you know, I've lived I, I lived through that generation where we were saying we had numerous threats at our school when I was going. I remember it. And I remember like my parents being like, you're not coming to school today because um, they were freaked out about it. That's so, so sad. So it's crazy. Um, and I remember like I, I had a bit that I tried like I was trying to make it work where it was like the idea was that like two shooters would show up at the same day. And there was like, well, this is embarrassing. One of us should change. But like I couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> but I couldn't. <laughs> That's great. It's good, but I couldn't. I I still can't. I still can't figure out like the flow of that. Like I think the premise is funny. I think that's a good premise. But I can't. I'm I'm still kind of working on ways to like make it flow and you that's know. That's like a Family a, Guy cutaway. It's yeah. just the shot yeah. of a school in the front, and then two shooters like walking towards right. each other and seeing each other. I really, I but. really am in love with that joke because I think it's, I, I, it, it is a joke that is about something that is really heinous, but it doesn't necessarily, <laughs> it doesn't make a joke out of the, the, well, first of all, it's non-specific. It's just, it's joking about the concept, and it's joking about like how absurd the scenario would be, and there's no like victims really in it. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's somehow a victimless joke about school shootings. Which is kind of which was difficult to even conceptualize in the first place, but yeah, but I yeah, still but that's the right angle. Yeah, I don't. I just don't know how to word it outside of the way that I. I've, I just pitched you the premise and you laugh. Thank you. Thank you. It's very good. That's good. <laughs> that's good for my notes. But I, I really. Yeah, but that's, that's the, the point. Is like it's it would be, 
it, you're you're explaining exactly what I, you're putting a really fine point on it, which is great, which is like it's a high skill space in comedy. The closer you get to the center of that drama, the more you need to be able to deliver on that. I think some people are having a problem with with Chappelle, for instance, recently. Sure. Like I know Ramon does like with a lot of his like the more trans humor. I find it funny personally, but I can see also the perspective of people being like. All right. I mean, we get it, you know, uh, yeah, like it was funny. It is funny. But we can move on now. It doesn't. It, it gets less funny, right? Uh, the more it, you it, you hang out here, you know, it, um, it becomes overwrought, and right. um, it just kind it just kind of feels like I lo- I love Chappelle. Chappelle's like one of my favorite comedians I think ever. Oh, like I, I think um the, the Chappelle Show and just all of his work on um oh my god I can't remember the name of his special from like the late nineties early two thousands but like it was, it was it was one of my favorites and uh, even Sticks and Stones one of his more recent ones I I loved his, so his joke about uh. The, the LGBT the LGBTQ car and like the, that analogy I thought was really fucking funny. His joke about a, a kid uh, being excited about Michael Jackson, and he was just like, "What? How was how was my weekend? <laughs> Michael Jackson sucked my dick." <laughs> i i was rolling on the floor with that shit and and like and you know the trans jokes like i I think some of them are funny but it does become a point where it's just like okay like you're Chappelle, you can do anything and you could do so much more and it's just like i get it like and to be fair like none of it's been as funny as his first go at it and that's what's kind of frustrating about it to to me as like as like a fan where it's just like you're just kind of beating this dead horse in a way that feels a little bit defensive. I feel like you're kind of reflexively digging your heels in because you're just like, yeah, no, I can down. say anything. And it's just like, it's not that you can't say anything. It's just kind of, it's, it's boring for me as personally as somebody who even likes those jokes that you do. It's just, I want to see you do more stuff because Dave Chappelle is like a really wise guy. And I, oh, I, so I think, the, I think the most offensive thing about his new, his newest special is that it's just kind of lazy. That's what's offensive to me. It was just like, okay, well, you're a brilliant guy. You can do better than this. And yeah, if you can't and just like wait until mid. you wait until you can. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I just think there is this this weird kind of energy around um, stand up lately where I feel like it's losing its identity. I, I feel like a lot of it has become complaining about not being able to do it while doing it. And it, it kind of, I don't know, it rubs me the wrong way just because like it's objectively false by nature of me observing you doing this. And it's not new anymore. It's a very old thing. Like, you can't say anything anymore. It's like, that was like in 2016, I was joking about that. Right. On YouTube. I remember watching a Bill Burr special that blew my mind because like all the jokes and like, or like the first half of like that, uh, Paper Tiger, I think it was. Yeah, Paper the first Tiger. Ha- yeah. The first half of Paper Tiger, which was like, I think 2020 or 2021, something like that. Were nah, all, it's older. It oh, was, you might be right. You it was around right. pandemic, or it was like just pre-pandemic time. But I remember I was like, dude, I was. This is like basically like my material from like 2014, 2015. And I hated that feeling. I was like, no way this is OK, because I, I, I do not want to. I don't want to see a professional comedian doing shit that I've grown out of. You know what I mean? As like an amateur, you it's just it's there's something about it that was like really kind of disappointing. The second half of that special is really good, but to be fair. But yeah, I. I all right, we're getting off topic, I guess, but um, I think um, I think generally anything is OK to joke about. I think obviously timing and consideration is fair. Like you're not going to joke about you're not going to make fun of grandma at the wake. You know, <laughs> uh, timing is, is important, but I think it's a good point. But I think skill is is also important. And I think you just have to and you also have to be OK with with a joke not landing, you know. I think that needs to be true for the people observing the joke and like writing opinion columns and like getting offended over everything. And I also think that needs to be true of the comedians who like if they tell a joke and it doesn't go over well, where it's like, okay, well, you know, it didn't go over well. That's part of the part of the job is stepping over the line and getting slapped and then, you know, figuring out a way to maybe get around it or maybe get further or maybe just like, okay, well, maybe that's not working. That's part of the craft. And and I feel like to complain about it is to, is to complain about the very nature of what being a comedian is. And I, I just don't find that very... I don't find that very inspiring. Personally. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was part of that Daniel Tosh slavery bit that he did, which he's, he's joking about one of the most heinous things in the, you know, in the history of human civilization, but certainly in American, you know, in our American past. But, 
you know, he does this thing where he kind of flips it around on the audience. It's very clever because he, he gets into this thing. It becomes silly. They laugh. And he basically ends it with, you know what? Now you're complicit. You yeah. laughed. Right. That you, you laughed just enough. I won't even do this joke like below the Mason Dixon line. If you laughed any harder than that, I would have been worried about you. So he flips the, the, the entire thing is so ingenious. Yeah. You know, that he, he kind of involves the audience. Now he makes them feel guilty. He's the one who did it. You know, he's, he's saying I instigated this, but you kind of, you know, now it's, now it's your problem type of thing. Yeah, and it was like this changing of hand, like this passing of the baton. It was like, wow, he really, it's, it's Matt, it's, it's masterful. And it makes me realize what you said about timing too, Chris, the timing is such an important part of the equation because there was a time certainly in my early to mid twenties where I didn't think it would be, you know, possible to laugh at nine 11. I was like, there, there'll never be a time. Remember feeling so, so shitty about it that I, I would say to myself, there's never a time where this could possibly be funny. And then, you know, skip a year or two later and it was like, it was becoming integrated into people's comedy routines. And it was, you know, they were finding a way to make a light of it, which I also think is very cathartic and therapeutic oh, yeah. for us to laugh at the things we're the most scared of. 100%. So yeah. important. I think um, what's that? What's that formula? Comedy equals tragedy plus time. Is like that famous. Uh, <laughs> yeah. is that, that famous. Um, yeah, very. Well equation. Said. I can't remember who the fuck said that, uh, or like who that's attributed to. But it's like it's something I always try to keep in mind whenever I'm trying to do anything like comedy oriented. Is that like you know there's there's an element of this that needs to be somewhat visceral or or, or somewhat or somewhat uncomfortable. But I do it. I don't know. Like there's there's some rules that are changing. There are words that you can't say and or, or whatever. And there's certain things that are like a little bit off topic. And I get the I get the frustration in that. But like at the same time, I, I do think it presents an opportunity to ch for challenge. I do think it's like, I don't know if we were allowed to say anything, then it wouldn't be funny that they're saying all this outrageous shit you know what i mean like the, the the whole reason why it's funny in the first place that people break those rules is because those rules exist and so to me i just wish that um more comedians would embrace this this feeling of like okay well that's we used to say this in the 80s we can't say this anymore that's a new challenge and how do i how do i then be funny within these within the confines of this new paradigm and and you know that's I think a skilled comedian can do that regardless. I, I don't think a skilled comedian necessarily needs to be offensive. I, I like offensive comedy personally, but like I like Daniel Tosh a lot and Anthony Jeselnik and, you know, yeah. they're, they're great comedians. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily this like huge like assault on, you know, like, oh, you can't say anything or whatever. And it's just like, I mean, you, you just got you're, you're saying this on, a, on your fifth special on Netflix. It just it just it rings very hollow in, yeah. in that in that way. For yeah. Me. I also think that there's some interesting effect too with sensitive, more sensitive audiences that, you know, racial humor, for instance, is hysterical to me. It always has been, always will be, as long yeah. as it's executed right. It doesn't have to be, and tastefully, I don't care. That doesn't have to be tasteful at all. Just make it funny. Um, but it's funny that like there's some relationship, no doubt, with people being like, you can't punch down. And we have these protected groups and all these things. And like the more special they make all these groups seem, the, the funnier the humor is. So they're almost going against their own self-interest by not just taking lumps along with every other in group or whatever that gets focused yeah. on in comedy, which is interesting to me because that, that seems like such an obvious thing goes in. It's a full circle thing with going into what you said about Chappelle, who's kind of just defensively reacting at this point by telling those jokes because he can, but he feels in turn that he has to do it because of this idea that there are these groups that can't be made fun of. You know? Yeah, and so everyone just needs to take it easy and realize that comedy is comedy, and and nothing more, nothing less. It's a form of fiction. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. Like, but it really is true. Yeah. I mean, it definitely yeah. is. It's like it, Chris and I have had the conversation before since we're both we both love comedy. Is like when people assume comedians are telling real stories about themselves. It's like they're lying all the time. What are you talking about? It's it's <laughs> yeah. it's it's like a rapper, a verse and a rap song. You know. Um, where it's about how much money the dude has and and all the rest. It's like there's just uh, it, it goes without saying, Dick. Um, I, I don't want to take over the topic. So no, no. I mean, from a storytelling perspective, I you know exactly that. That's that's also part of it too. Micah, do you gotta you gotta take a spin around this topic, my friend? What are you uh, what are you thinking about this? Yeah the the funny thing is 
when you really do learn how some people just take like that really can't take any sort of jokes i saw on facebook my friend's mom got mad at him because he made a titanic joke and she was like people died on titanic and it's like jesus christ woman like I, do we even have any living Who survivors cares? anymore it's been that long ago but then it's like you're telling me it was too <laughs> soon to make a titanic joke so like the number one thing to realize is that there will always be someone who will be yeah. offended no matter what because it's like it could it just it's the fucking titanic okay like it's everyone is dead who was ever on it all right so let's just <laughs> pretend that like we don't have to worry about offending them they're all gone for me when it comes to stand up th- there's nothing that really is untouchable especially if you guys know i love memes and when it comes to my my precious memes there really isn't anything too sacred to not make fun of i think like the only thing i thought of similar to colin was like actual animal abuse. Like if you make a meme saying like, oh, my cat's a real bastard. I ought to kick him. Like, that's funny. If you showed me a video of someone actually kicking a cat, it's like, well, that like that's too far. I don't want to well, actually see somebody uh, actually yeah, well, kicking a dog or something. It ceases to be a joke at that point because now yeah, just, that's it's real. That's just real. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so that's the thing of like, though, that's really the, the line of what I think is funny. But when it comes to like stand up and, and memes and all that, it's like, really anything could be funny and like colin and i joke in our own home like i use the n-word frequently as a joke uh <laughs> and it all it gets colin every time and it's just one of those things she really of does like, just break it out i'm like oh <laughs> I never knew just that. randomly just randomly you know you gotta spice it in there once in a while it catches it off guard, get the Michael, laugh. do you end it with the er or do you end it with a you know we're using the er for the joke <laughs> usually for like the, okay need, colin's need, playing that need. game Punishers. i'm not gonna say it i'm not gonna say it because i don't want us to get like demonetized or whatever of course but i started calling banishers the n-word uh, witch game <laughs> and i'm like colin playing the n-word witch game and it get it it always oh works my God. sweeney so, would sweeney would love you because that's, <laughs> that's his entire so like, just, i would it, <laughs> I'd wake up. I'd wake up, and he would say "Good morning," and he would say he would say "Good morning." That and I'd be like, I'd be like no. I'm just like I, it's the first thing I hear this morning. Like, leave me alone. Let me survive, please. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's so Sorry. it is. It's like no, I definitely I see humor in a lot of things, in a lot of weird things, and I, you're right, Chris. Of like, we did grow up in a weird time. Like 9-11 happened. The recession happened. We lost our house when I was a kid. My mom lost her job. We were very poor. Like a lot of bad stuff has happened. It's hard to find something that I can't laugh at because yeah. it's that whole if I don't laugh, I'll cry. Mm. So it's like, exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, it's it's just one of those things of like somebody has, you have a health scare or something and, you know, you end up being OK. It's just like yeah, things you can laugh at later. You know, so I don't know, because I I do. I was going through my memes in like preparation of this topic. And I'm like, there's just an assortment here of memes about suicide and, you know, 9-11 and all these terrible things. And it's like, but I don't know, man, we don't laugh at it. Well, what, I'm just going to be sad all the time. We're just going to just gonna cry about it. No, no suicide is another good, a good example. That's a tough thing to make a joke about, but you can you can do it. Oh yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. I, I say I'm going to kill myself all the time. By the way, like it's uh, like it's there's there's different levels right. to it. You know? Like, yeah, yeah. There yeah. is something I, deeply funny about the idea that something bothers something trivial bothers you so much that you would remove yourself from the planet. Like that's exactly. going to always be when funny. You know? Yeah, I mean, McDonald's put ice in my Coke. I'm going to kill myself. Like the, kill it myself. is funny. Yeah, it's like, you got to yeah, you got to deliver it right. Like, in. Yeah, but I sold <laughs> I sold merch with that. Literally with that, like I had the I had the Seinfeld logo, but it just said kill me, and then I had uh, the Friends logo, and it's it, it was it just said kill me with like the the dots in the middle, in the same font and and color. It's it's funny. Like it's it, it, I don't know, man. It's we've talked a lot about it, but I I think. Uh, I think it would be better if we could if if everybody lightened up, really, like every if audiences understood the job of a comedian and if comedians understood the job of the comedian as well, <laughs> you know, like, you, you know, you, you're going to say stuff that doesn't work f- for the for maybe maybe you'll say stuff that doesn't work for your audience. And maybe it's like, OK, well, you know, 
take a note, you know, like uh, it, uh, improvise, like improve, like tailor it. Like that's, that's the whole point of workshopping material in the first place right. is to try and fail and try and fail until you get something that works. You can't just like lash out the second it fails and be like, oh, well, why, why aren't you laughing? It's like, well, it's your job. Yeah, it's, like, it's your job is to make people laugh, like regardless of how sensitive people are, or like how, regardless of like what the sensibilities are. It's your, your job is ultimately to make people laugh. And if you can't do that, then you've you're you failed. Try again. No, I love that. Uh, it's, it's true. It's the message. It's the messenger. It's a whole complex thing from yeah. the perspective of the person delivering. But th- the responsibility is also on the audience. And I think that's true. I think if everybody could collectively just, you know, it's hard to tell every, the masses to lighten up. But really, I like that because then it's a whole thing. It's a, it's a responsibility on both ends. And it just makes for better material. And just in the, honestly, not just for humor, not just for entertainment, but like we said, just in terms of therapy, what could be healthier than that? Yeah. You need to be able to laugh at something and to be able to, you know, ultimately be able to find comedy in everything. Just, you know, it's like taking a spoonful of sugar with the medicine, man. Like life is hard enough. Like let's find a way to laugh at shit. It is also yeah. like the most ephemeral like to, uh, comedy it ages so f- quickly um, mm. in comparison to a lot of other things. Like there's very few movies from like the seventies that were comedies that are still funny, I would argue. And I don't even necessarily think that's like a bad thing. I just think it like th- that sensibility like changes so dra- like so drastically, even before like the internet and, and all this stuff like drastically shifted everything else at a, at a far quicker time frame. Like I just, you know, that's always going to change. And, uh, if you're going to be in that career path for as long as you plan on being this, you're going to, you're going to have to adapt in some way. And that might yeah, be frustrating. Evolve. It's frustrating for sure. Like I get it. It's just like, Oh, what the fuck? Come on. Like, is this really that big of a deal? It's like, and you can feel that and believe that and you can even say it, but like ultimately like, yeah, it's, that's the job. So yeah, things run their course. You have to evolve. And that, like what you're saying about Chappelle, it's like, I, I'll listen to him talk about the transgender thing, continuing to talk about whatever he wants to talk about. But there is something in there where it's like, oh, now let's, let's see, you, you're funny about everything. You could come up with the most brilliant material. It would be cool to see you move on from that, you know, yeah. type of thing. What, what's next type of thing in, in, the, in the terms of like, you know, just rooting for somebody, being a fan of somebody and seeing it's like putting out a new album. Like you don't want the same album over and over again from your favorite right, band. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm personally pretty, pretty bummed that he's never, we've never been included. Not a single Puerto Rican joke at all. And I'm like, we're, come on. <laughs> That's we're here. It's not just Mexicans, you know, there are other <laughs> yeah. Spanish people. Yeah. Are we invisible? <laughs> yeah. Dig, this is just strange, strange timing. Mike's dad text, text messaged me. Okay. He text messaged me first a picture of some Goya frozen food that he he bought that he's going to cook <laughs> oh. himself, okay? And okay. I thought that, that was kind of strange, but then he texted me this. I'm dining alone tonight and selected this meal in honor of Dagan, who finds it sad for someone to cook a meal just for themselves. I'm going to use the time I save cooking to work on finding a nice balance of tequila, beer, and cannabis with music that suits my mood. What a guess. <laughs> I love listening to you guys. Please share this message with your brother. Oh, I love I love that. You know what's funny about that? I really meant... Obviously, people live by themselves and have to cook by themselves. I really meant when people are like going all out, like they're deglazing the sauce. They got the two saute pans going and they, you know, they, they're they doing all the fancy plating and only to just enjoy the sights and sounds and the taste of the food themselves. Like a TV dinner, something quick and easy, that doesn't make me sad. But when somebody spends two or three hours really going all out to make a gourmet, gourmet meal for themselves... That just breaks my heart. I don't know what it is about. Yeah, that. I get that. I, I get the difference of what you're saying too. Yeah, like I, I don't you know. know that. He's not. I don't think this represents what you were talking about. Beef empanadas. No, no, no he's okay. He's okay. <laughs> I don't feel. Yeah, good. I know what you mean too. Of like when I lived alone, for example, I did. I ate a lot of like not like frozen dinners necessarily. Like like the Trader Joe's like orange chicken, for example. Make that with some rice and something. Like and yeah. it just wasn't because it's like, am I going to put in all this effort? For one person and B, I want some leftovers, but not a week's worth of leftovers. That was the bigger like part of like, I just don't want to cook an entire meal and have to eat it for a week or throw it out. I'd rather just make a small quantity of food. Well, frozen food's very easy to divvy up out of the package and just deal with. I do want to say, though, Dagan, like you're like a celebrity 
to my dad because he told me at one point that you replied to his YouTube comment. And like, oh, he texted I didn't me, like, I didn't reply to my YouTube him. comment. And I was just like, oh, hot dog. You're talking to celebrities now, dad. Like, you're I don't think I knew it was him. <laughs> one on one with the Dagster. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. I didn't know he listened to the shows. Rubbing elbows. He does, which is always funny because then I realize, oh, shit, what weird thing did I say this week? You know, because he'll text me something random about an episode. And then I'm like, Christ, is that the one that, you know, we were making weird jokes? I mean, they all are. But I was like, yeah. oh, how, how weird did it get this week? You know, and realizing that dad probably heard that one. Yeah, yeah well, you, you got to let it fly anyway. Just know, I, I embrace that with the parent. Like, I know they're listening and I just, I'll let them have it. Like, you just got to look like, you just got to let it fly. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, because my dad knows I have a pretty dark sense of humor anyways, but like there, there is a line with dad. He's, he's a very friendly man. And like one time we were watching, we were watching TV together and that eye patch guy who's on the news a lot was on. And I was like, eyewitness news. And he was like, oh, my God. Like, you know, couldn't believe that someone would say that. And I was just, and it's just, boy, it's like it's a man in an eye patch. Uh, is that like Dan, it's, Dan it's, Crenshaw? Just, it's right there. Yeah, Dan Crenshaw, I think, is who she's talking about. Is yeah. that who he is? Yeah, I have I no idea who the man is. Oh, he's, he's on TV. Yeah. 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 But my dad was like almost a gas. Like, how could you say that? And it's like, he's right there. And also, he can't hear me. The number one thing for me with making fun of people within the comfort of my own home is that they can't hear me. If I make fun of someone who's on TV, I'm not posting it on Twitter. I'm right. not going on Reddit and saying, ha, huh, this guy's looking fat today. Like this is in the privacy of my own home and no one is harmed by it. You're not, you're not even violent. Colin occasionally will be like, oh, that's mean, you know, and it's like that they can't hear me. And I would never say it to their face. And I would never, aside from right now with this eye patch guy, <laughs> I would never say this anywhere else all right if i see somebody kind of funny looking on tv and i say it in the comfort of my own home that's like there's nobody yeah, nobody's I, harmed I, by I, this i, totally I didn't say that. it to anybody and i'd never say it to their face or out in public yeah and that's another thing of like yeah that'll always be funny to me because just what you what you can say in your own house without without hurting anyone's feelings you know and they'll never know the lady in that in that commercial that we always make fun of she doesn't know she doesn't, there's this one commercial that always comes on and we always make fun of the lady because she dances weird and she'll never know. And that's all, and it's, that's I know, all yeah, right. I, yeah, we, we always are making fun of that lady. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She's very memorable. No, she's hysterical. But yeah, she does this weird like Elaine Kicks dance. It's his, and they <laughs> oh, mean it. Yeah. They're going for it. Um, it goes into, I told the story just recently, like the, it goes into that story I told of uh, my friend Abby in school and how I, we were, me and her roommate got into a fight for some reason we were mad at each other and so I on an aim message to Abby I called her roommate fat and then her roommate went on her computer without permission and saw that I called her fat so she confronted me about it and I was like I'm really sorry that you saw that but you weren't supposed to see it and so I'm not I didn't like say it to you or like say it in the way that was gonna get or like write a fucking placard about it you or, held your ground yeah it's like yeah well I was just like I'm sorry that you saw that that wasn't the intention but you also did something dishonest in order to see it I can't really do much about that so I think you're right, Mikey, that like the context is important. I'll joke about whatever I want like, and say whatever I want in the con in, in private. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that I think is that is, I think that's a rule that everybody adheres to. And nobody there, there's certain people that refuse to admit that that's true. Um, Because like, I mean, wait, well, you, you're going to be prim and proper the entire time. Isn't that fucking exhausting? I don't know. <laughs> like, it just seems it seems that you should do that when it matters. You know, like, who, who are you trying um, to impress, really? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it just seems really like self-aggrandizing in some way, and it just I, I don't I don't value that. My dad is like, my dad is like the opposite of of <laughs> like my dad would never be like, oh, I can't believe you said that. I, I often have to be like, Dad, hey, listen, <laughs> you can't do the accents anymore. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Yo, I was thinking about that recently, though. Why is it offensive to do like an Indian accent but not a British accent? Really? Why yeah, is I that? Mean, what, what's the difference? I per, I personally don't care. I just don't feel like getting in trouble. I, no, I, I agree <laughs> with you, and I would neither. I would also not do that. Like, but, Dad, we're at a restaurant right now. Like, Dad, yes, yes, these are <laughs> yes, yes, these are spicy wontons. Please, please, <laughs> please contain yourself. I understand <laughs> that you are seventy six, and there's only so much that I can do. <laughs> but for me, <laughs> just because I don't know, like, look. Accents are fun to do. That's really the thing. I don't even think it's like necessarily that it's like a joke or like it's like necessarily making fun. It's just fun to do accents. 
just generally. Oh, yeah. It's like playing a character oh, no. in anything. There's so you know <laughs> there are accents that that me and my friends do absolutely. <laughs> that well, you'll just probably marrying not hear into in like an Italian family. I'm doing the Italian accent. All day, oh, yeah, yeah. but it's mostly because Colin's family doesn't actually sound like this, and that's where it's like I'm not actually making fun of them because they don't sound like this at all. But I'm like, oh Madonna, yeah. oh, oh my oh, god, Madonna. like nobody sounds like this in his family. Like I'm not, e- I'm not really making fun of them at all because none of them even actually sound like that. But my joke is just that now I'm Italian and I get to be Italian and I get to say all these phrases now. Oh, I got the agita, like. I, it's great, <laughs> but no, it's like I'm not actually making fun of me, them as people because yeah, they don't even sound like this. Me and my friend, me and my uh, my Jewish friend, we uh, I have to say that I have to that needs to be a preface to this story. Preface it. But uh, we we have so often just gotten high and just done this like old like complaining kind of like oh what's going on. <laughs> Oh, what's happening here? Please leave me alone. And it it, it cracks us the fuck up. And we, we found ourselves like accidentally doing it at like a, a restaurant or something. It was like, we ha- oh, wait, <laughs> like we probably should like cool it a little bit. I don't know how offensive it is or like if I don't even really care necessarily. It's more just like I don't, I don't want to make like a whole thing. I don't think there's anything morally wrong with it, by the way. I'm just like, yeah. I just I don't mean, need a, I don't need another headache. You know what I mean? Meanwhile, yeah. you're on a meanwhile you start clicking and they call you a racist. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see that fa- that family guy thing where it's, it was like uh, 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 it was like a cutaway, but it was like a Kenyan Willy Wonka thing where like they found like a golden ticket and it was just like the sky running, and then he falls and he goes he he does that famous knee thing from Family Guy where he goes. <laughs> and it was that, and I was like that that's fucking that's funny. It's dumb. It's dumb Family Guy shit. <laughs> family Guy makes me laugh I love outside guy. of the context of like watch. Like I could never sit and watch an episode, but if like a clip pops up in like my feed, I'll watch it. And more often than not, it will like put a smile on my face yeah, in some way. It's still good. Strange. It's like a clip show more. It's like almost more for TikTok than it is for like sitting and watching. It's strange. That's a good. That's a good. Point. That's how I feel about it. Because outside of like. Some really classic episodes. The one where Peter finds out that he's special needs. That is a that entire episode is hysterical. And he's playing like children's monopoly or whatever. (laughs) It's like that episode. But there are very few family guy episodes that I like enjoy the entire thing. I I always dislike like his thing of running a joke completely into the ground. Yeah, like yeah. here's a barbershop quartet and they are going to sing for five minutes of the 20 minute show. I'm like, it's too much. It's too much. Like it stopped being funny 30 seconds in like, and that's just one of their things though. And it's just yeah, not for me. I, so like, I love that because it's breaking. It is ball. more of a clip show for me. I, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that is annoying. However, there are, I think of like Norm Macdonald, who's somebody who like almost specializes, almost like revels in wasting people's time with a joke. And that kills me. So I think it, it is all, I guess, in the in the personality and the specifics yeah. of what's being. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the delivery sells it like Norm Macdonald. Um, is it Mike Tyson Mysteries? That cartoon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he has. Yeah, he has some jokes on there that are like really long winded. But half of it is just that his voice is so funny. And I never would get sick of listening to him. So no. it is very specific of like, well, if it's Norm Macdonald making this really long winded joke, I'm not going to get sick of it. But half of that's just because he sounds funny as well. Yeah, like, yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the payoff is going to be great. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's always. And even if it sucks, it's funny that you waited that long. That's what's <laughs> yes, that's, he, that's, he a, has, that's a joke in itself. He has this brilliant way of just wasting your time. And even if it's not good, it becomes good by virtue of having wasted your time. It's strange. Like he's like, I'm sad, I'm genuinely sad that he's gone. Like that was. Oh, it's uh, it's he, we've really lost someone special. Yeah, because it's it's ball busting. It's just like what Family Guy do, Family Guy does. It's it's the same energy. It's just busting balls. Which I don't know. Maybe you have to be from the Northeast to appreciate that. But I, if you're in for that, if you're game, I think it's always funny. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Are we? Uh, are we satiated? Yeah, I took my glove off. I slapped you in the face. I demanded satisfaction. We fought a duel. <laughs> I won. Well, and I'm satisfied. Good judge, jury, and executioner. Very well. <laughs> All right, my topic is last, and I, I wanted to. We can go fairly quickly here, but I wanted to talk to this selection of people because I feel like you guys would have interesting insights into what I wanted to talk about. Um, 
as has come out up on different shows recently, I've been really playing around with this kind of this idea that there's something special about the online creator in that they need to know when to walk away because there will be no there's no studio or like group or union or whatever to like be like, all right, you're done or you you can just kind of keep going and going and going and going. And all of the things that would kind of wash you out in other instances on TV or in film or whatever in traditional media doesn't necessarily exist here. And so I saw a video from this. Uh, I watch all sorts of shit on YouTube and I, I follow this guy, eight, this guy, eight bit guy, and he's in Texas. He's really interesting. He does like a lot of 80s, some 70s, but 80s computer stuff mostly with. And I'm really in the computer, like old computer stuff, because we were much more console people. I didn't get a computer until our dad got one in like 93, but we didn't really have a family computer until like 96. So we were a little late to the Internet and all that compared to some of my contemporaries. And just we didn't we weren't messing around with PCs and, and Macs and stuff at home up to that point. So I'm really interested in that content. And he put up this video, which I thought was fa- kind of fascinating, a little sad and I thought strange. And that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about, which was he basically goes into the status of his channel and how he's, he's doing far less and he makes way less. And it's kind of like in this, I don't know if he looks at it as like a death spiral or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, this is interesting. This is, there, there's a lifespan of talent on YouTube that has always come and gone, but it, it's it got to be self-manufactured in some way. And I'm really interested in that. One of the things he said was that when he started doing his channel, he was unique, but that, now there's like hundreds of channels that do what he does. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. But I'm also of the mind that like YouTube's broad enough where many different things can survive. And I guess the reason I wanted to talk to you guys about YouTube is because obviously Chris has been a YouTube creator since very early on on the platform. And as I wrote in our email for the show, Dagan really was the first person I ever knew that used YouTube as like a daily thing going back 15 years, maybe or more. Yeah. Um, as like a consumer, I was so late to it compared to Dagan for years. He would always ask me, you watch this. Do you see this? Do you see this? Did you watch this? And I'm like, I don't even know anything you're talking about. And then some, some point probably around the time I left kind of funny, I, I kind of got into YouTube more as a consumer and I find it so fascinating and so interesting, but it is full of just a lot of stuff. Things have been pointed out to me about it recently that I thought were kind of a bummer. Like some of the big channels or a lot of it is just even like automated and like very much you realize it's like all stock footage and yeah, but in the, in the crevices are like really interesting things and a lot of, and some prominent big things as well. But anyway, I, I wanted to know based on kind of his, so I should I actually I should introduce one more thing, which is that there's another guy I listened to on YouTube, Rick Beato, who's awesome. He does music stuff. And he put up a YouTube video saying his channel is bigger than ever. And that that's unusual because channels begin to decline after five to six years on average or whatever. And that he's really grateful. And these are the things he's trying to do right. So I, I guess based on these kind of recent experiences, obviously, we have a YouTube presence, but it's not really vital for me. I mean, it's cool to be there and it's, it's important, but. And it's a high growth portion of our business but it's we're not we're not made for youtube really in some ways um so i don't think we're gonna ever thrive there like some of our contemporaries do but i'm curious like what you guys think the health is as a creator and uh, also as a consumer of of goods on youtube and where you think that the, the platform's going and if you feel like it's in a more positive place now than it was and so on and so forth so chris i want to go to you first uh and hear what you think about how youtube is doing man yeah i mean it's a very I've been on the platform since 2007 God. and and that was like, oh my God, how old was I? My math brain is not 13. working right now. You were so young. Yeah, 13, 14, something like that. Wow. Um, And I had a channel even earlier than that. I had, I had a channel in 2006 that I lost because I just, I didn't think I would ever go back on the site because I was just like, you know, it was like, oh, I'll sign in to like for once and then for I forgot like the login information for it. So I made a new one in 2007. So I've been, I've, and I've been uploading ever since then. Um, not anything serious. I spent a lot of time just sort of like making bullshit with like with and for my friends. And what's interesting about YouTube is that like, it, it really did start off like Facebook in some way. It was like every, every, everyone that I knew had a YouTube channel and they made videos. 
like before there was any reason to or before there was any like financial incentive to do it we just were having fun like making our own shows and showing it to each other and like we we, we built this own like we, we almost built our fake like this fake like tv network in our heads with it's like oh yeah you have this show and and uh you you come on this show and then i'll go on your show or whatever and it was it was fun it was just like this uh very tightly knit. and sometimes people from outside would see it and whatever like that was like not really the the important thing and so it's strange to come from that era and from that from that period in time and and with that motivation to see like what it is now because what it is right now i feel like is a lot of people who have come in understanding a profit motive exists um and i think is it healthier than it's ever been? I, I don't think so, personally. I, I do find like the, the identity of the platform has shifted so drastically from when I fell in love with it to the point where like I don't even know if I care that much about it. I like doing the things that I used to do for YouTube, but like I don't know if I, I like engaging with the system as much as I, I used to, purely because it does feel so algorithm-centric, and it does feel like, oh, there's a meta here, or like there's a, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it, when like back when I started, there was no... There was no such thing as a right way or a wrong way. Like it was just you did it and whatever happened, happened. Um, and so it's it's strange. I, I don't my relationship with it is 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 somewhat frayed. Cause on some level it's it's I'm really lucky to have like an audience there. And I understand that even even though I've like kind of like left my channel to kind of like uh sit there unattended for a while, I know that if I come back. I can get a lot of people watching again. Maybe not as many as as are subscribed because that number is completely useless. I actually hate. I actually don't like the idea that the subscriber number even stays static in that way. Like I almost wish that I could purge channels that I know are dead. Like I the the because there's so many channels that are subscribed to you that have only signed in once to subscribe or have signed in like last signed in seven years ago or whatever, and there's no reason for them to be there. They don't actually count towards any meaningful metric. So it's a little frustrating to see like, oh, 600,000 subs or whatever. And then like the video gets like 300,000 views. And it's like, I understand what's happening here, but it's a little annoying that I can't whittle down that number manually so that it makes a little bit more sense. And it's a little bit more emblematic of my active audience. Because I would rather have like 100,000 active members than 100,000 active members and then 500,000 dead ones that are just sitting there in a, in a statistics library. Um so that's like a level of frustration. I, th I think the the fact that it's so gamified and, and what is necessary of a content creator now is just so like fucking unrealistic where like you need somebody editing for you. You need somebody to manage the channel. Like you have to have people editing clips and, and, and doing all this, doing YouTube shorts and managing the community tab. And it's like, oh my fucking God, like this used to be something that you could do on your own. Like the whole point of it was that you were kind of escaping to do this thing on your own. And now it just kind of feel like it's impossible to do that without a team. And as somebody who just doesn't really work well with a team as like a manager or, or like an owner, like I'm not, I'm not an organized person. Like I, I cannot, <laughs> I can't sit there and be like, Oh yeah, I'll have this to you by the end of the day for, to send out to this sponsor or whatever. It's like, I have to do all that my own. And maybe that's like a stubbornness that I should kind of let go of, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I just feel like it's such a different platform. And I do feel like the apocalypse really fucked everything up in a, in a big way that and, and not even necessarily from like, oh, people made less money because I don't really care about that. Like it was it was cool, like raking in money, like when before the apocalypse happened and it was like dope. But it wasn't I, you know, I, I was I would have been fine with half of that amount. You know what I mean? Like I, I didn't really care. It was cool that I was successful, but it wasn't really important. And so to me, what I did notice was that the second that happened and the second it started, the rules started getting a lot tight, tightly knit and you started not being able to say things and you started not being able to cover certain topics without mm -hmm. the yellow dollar sign going on. And you had to wait. Oh, you have to wait 30 seconds to a minute before you curse in your video or else or else it'll get picked up by the thing or, or like, oh, this is a current event that you can't talk about. So it's going to be instantly demonetized. And it's like. I think that kind of led to people no longer feeling comfortable doing what they wanted to do. And instead, it led to people really needing to double down on pandering to their audience in some way. Um, and I see that I saw this a lot in the political space where I, I feel like there are people who used to be a little bit more even handed and, and a little bit more honest who then started suddenly like 
like after that point in time started specifically just kind of not being very critical and really like go, going over the top with like just like peddling stuff to their audience and like suddenly like the merch started opening up and it's like okay i see i see what's happening now it's unfortunate because i i think that happened as a result of people no longer feeling safe doing what they felt comfortable doing as a sustainable business model because they were just kind of constantly getting demonetized or getting uh de-emphasized in the algorithm and and there's all these like back like backdoor tricks about like how much you're supposed to upload exactly when like what the SEO should be. Tags don't matter at all, by the way. <laughs> Tags like stopped mattering ages ago, but like it's still there as an option that you could use. It's so fucking wasteful. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I have a complicated relationship with it. Um, I still watch it regularly. There's a lot of creators that I watch, but every now and then I'll stumble across a video that's fucking completely AI driven. Or like it's like a, it's like a, a, a robot voice with like like you said earlier, Colin, stock footage mm-hmm. or like screen caps or like or like a robot TikTok voice saying, oh, top 10 fucking whatever. And it's like, what the fuck is this? And then you have people being like, oh, he unalived himself because I can't say killed. And it's like this fucking blows. And uh, when I when I and I've been actually toying around with the idea of kind of um coming back uh, in a real in like a real way like regularly and I, cause I want to cover politics again. Cause I think it's so f- interesting right now. And I assure you, I will, I will be saying killed. <laughs> if someone got killed, they got killed. They didn't get fucking unalive. unalive. That's insane. Yeah, it is. It is crazy. Dave, where are you on this, uh, on this topic as a consumer? Yeah, man. I mean, I love it. When I found YouTube, I really fell in love. I mean, I guess to my best recollection, it would have been like late, 2006 early 2007 where i sort of discovered it and you know what i found there was just like this sick one-stop shop of just stuff to watch and mostly listen to to be honest with you because my eyeballs were all tied up in animating all day so i needed this thing and it became like this companion and i loved the variety you know i mean prior to this literally what i was listening to while i worked all day was like terrestrial radio like npr or bbc world news or whatever or whatever satellite content or maybe like in the late 90s you know i'm really going back but like real audio player streams of like undergroundhiphop.com or something but youtube was like this place where you could get music or retro video game shows or old tv episodes vintage cartoon intros interviews new and old people doing their dvd dumps so special editions and making ofs of insert movie here, whatever audio books, like, and just becoming cozy with playlists and just listening to whatever you wanted, however your, you know, whatever mood struck you and just really diving in. And then as the years progressed, there was just more and more stuff. And it was just like, I, I don't need to go anywhere else. This, this has, this literally has everything. And no matter what my taste is or what I'm in a mood for that day. And um, it's been interesting. So from, from, a, from a fan perspective and from a consuming perspective, that's been interesting. I'll tell you what I miss about YouTube though. Now, I'm, I'm just as big of a fan. It's mostly what I'm watching. It's mostly what I'm listening to all day long as I work. But I miss the old YouTube like lo-fi badly filmed, muffled audio, very basement level production value, you know, people holding the camcorder up to the TV to film retro video game content. (laughs) Yeah. Just like now everything seems so sophisticated from the jump. Like you'll see guys jump into YouTube, the production values and the sophistication. And quite frankly, oftentimes like the talent is so high and you watch these guys progress. Like you may discover somebody, you may kind of come in at the basement level on the entry, you know, on the entry floor level and, and see this guy and he has less than a thousand subscribers. And then you could see the evolution as you tune into the content every couple of weeks. It's like, oh, this guy's got three grand now. Now he's got 10 grand. But you could see why, because it's so, I, I think the technology is a lot better for making this stuff, for making the content than 2006 or 2007. But also it's people more are just- yeah. That that period of figuring it out, like 
before the Elgato and the capture cards and everything, people were kind of, you know, there was an Ed Wood quality to YouTube that I almost think we're going to enter, we're going to usher in this era of trying to emulate that. Like, let's go back to early AVGN, where not only was James Rolfe hungry, but he was also figuring it out. And he did, you know, he was, he had like an old, 90s shoulder mounted camcorder and he didn't have the tech yet and he he was in his parents basement and it felt it felt you know what it really reminded me of when you sent the topic call youtube really feels to an old guy like me like an extension of what we knew of public access tv growing up which started in the u.s i guess in the late 60s into the early 70s and we grew up with it in the 80s but that was a very provincial sort of independent content content creation so you could go on public access and do like a painting instructional show or music or a puppet show for kids or whatever that's kind of what youtube kind of felt like an extension of all of that as cable died and terrestrial tv died and all that kind of thing and what I love about it is from a fan pers- from a consumer perspective, it's to the point now, now literally to a very nuanced degree, no matter what you love you can, and what you want to immerse yourself in, it exists on YouTube in droves probably, right? The other thing is from a creator perspective, no matter what you want to talk about or you know, whatever, regardless of the passion that you want to impart, or embrace or share with people, you could do that. And with some blood, sweat, and tears, and some skill, and some knowledge, and the willingness to work hard, and a little bit of luck thrown in, you could find an audience. Like it's what I started telling people in animation. And I think, you know, people got scared of this notion, like my colleagues, my fellow animators, and stuff, the people in the trenches, the wrists, if you will. I started saying this probably in like 2014, 2015, like, guys, we literally don't need these people anymore. I know I'm under their roofs <laughs> telling you this right now. I know I'm in Nickelodeon, yeah. you know, drawing a paycheck from them saying we don't need them, but we literally don't need them. Like if we just, if we're willing to starve for a year, we could do it ourselves, whether that's a podcast or a cartoon series, you know, that, that and I guess that kind of idea was ushered in way before Rick and Morty and stuff like that, but with like new grounds and stuff. But that in the, the this model of being able to be successful as an independent without working for the man that there's something so cool about that so when chris tells me he wants to jump he he's thinking about jumping back into the youtube thing regularly and somebody as talented as him that excites me because i know chris could do that and be very successful at it and he has been but i know you know drop of a hat he could do that and he could do that without being under the umbrella of a traditional conventional entertainment company. You know, Chris is the entertainment company now. He has the skill to do that on his own. He has the now he has the knowledge to do it. He has the experience. He built a name for himself, but he also has the talent and everything he needs under his roof to do which is that's crazy. I come out of an era where that wasn't the case yet. And I've seen the evolution, so there is an excitement. I, and hearing Chris talk about his frustrations with how it's evolved And how long he's been involved as a creator is eye-opening for me because I don't know that side of it. And Mm. that must be very frustrating. Well, I I mean, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit complaining. Like I get like things change and like, you just have to kind of adapt and that's fine. I I get it. I, I, I guess I lament it just because when I came into it, like I was, I was very young. And so I was coming into this world already where like everything was very, very set in stone. Like everything that had existed since I was born was this megalithic thing. Like you had Walmarts and and these, these big companies and like big networks and all these things that were like pretty entrenched already. And and it, it, these, these places felt kind of impenetrable, especially, um, when you're in high school during like this massive economic downturn and like there's, there's really not a lot of mobility happening. I just remember feeling like, wow, this is, um, this is a, a bleak place. Um, and then YouTube was there as this really, it was like the closest thing that we had to getting in on the ground floor of something 
that was truly new in a in a in a in a real way like the internet was old already by the time youtube happened but we never had anything like that where it's like oh you could actually be your own production company basically like if you had the means and if you had the drive and if you had the talent like Mm -hmm. you could do it like there was nothing really in your in your way and i remember feeling like this is exciting to me this is exciting to me because it is so new there are so few rules and nobody no way anybody in in like there's no supreme court the supreme court doesn't know what this is you know what i mean like they have no fucking idea like it's gonna take ages crazy? to regulate this it still hasn't really been regulated all that much at all no, so it's like the wild west yeah it was it it there was a wild west quality to it um that was really exciting to kind of figure out and and make make it work in and there was all sorts of stuff that i tried on on youtube early on i tried like reviews i tried music i tried the early I, I I was doing political commentary even back then I was I, I had a lot of videos making fun of um there was I specifically remember there was <laughs> I specifically remember Glenn Beck on Fox News freaking out about Grand Theft Auto Four and telling it everybody how it was gonna it was gonna I I remember the line very vividly where it was like video games are training your sons to become killers and they're training them to tweet to treat women like whores <laughs> and I remember it very <laughs> it was fun. Because I, I could like lambast this. I was like this kid lambasting this guy. And it got like a thousand views. And everybody was like, yeah, fuck Glenn Beck. And I was like, this is interesting. Because <laughs> I had no idea that you could even make money from doing that, by the way, at that point. I was, just, I was just fucking around just to see what like what I liked and what people liked. And what was the highest equivalency that I could find? Like, what do I like the most that the people watching like the most that I can be like comfortable and being like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And it took a while for me to figure out what that was. But by the I'd worked seven years on YouTube before I even saw like a penny, you know, wow. and because uh, I didn't really think of it as like I didn't I don't know. I, I just did it because I wanted to do it. And I feel like now it's it's kind of strange because not, not that there aren't people who are like very successful from back in the day who've absolutely deserved it. I think, um, you know, Smosh was back there back in the day and they've or they earned their success and all that stuff. But, you know, when I see newer people come in or like when I see like a, a new crowd come in, it's like it, it, it kind of feels a little bit less special because it's like, well, you know, there's something to get out of this now. It's not like a you're not here for the same reasons that I'm here. And so I feel mm. very, very disconnected to you because I'm here because I like to do this and you're here because it's smart to do. Like this is this was under no circumstance was this a smart thing for me to do <laughs> for me to drop out of college and do this at the time that I did. It made no fucking sense. My parents were scared shitless. And the only yeah. reason that they were OK with it was eventually I was able to ju- I, I walked like I went to Best Buy and I bought them the nicest TV they've ever owned. They've, you know, and I was like, hey, yeah, this is uh, this is from the videos, by the way. And they were like, oh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's Jerry Seinfeld buying his parents a Cadillac. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. Right? Except it went a lot better than that. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it's still a great, it's a great platform. Like I use it all the time. Uh, I, I just feel like there's like an etiquette that was there that isn't really there anymore. And, and it's not necessarily anybody's fault. It's just the nature of people phasing in and phasing out new, new people coming in, new people going out. Um, but how I always felt about it was like, if you really succeeded to the degree that you were like now on television, like I, th- I think about Sean Evans with uh, Hot Ones. Uh, it's gr- a great show. Like actually, oh, great like, show. it's a really smart idea. It's like authentically entertaining. Um, th- it's a very smart idea. But then I remember s- I saw, I was scrolling to, I, I can't remember what platform or what streaming service. I think it was Netflix, but I might be wrong. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> it was one of them. And I saw Hot Ones on it. And I remember being like, there was a part of me that felt like, you shouldn't also be on YouTube if you're here. Yeah. Like that kind of felt like it, it, it. YouTube should have always been like a place where either you wanted to be or a stepping tone, a stepping stone to something else. I like, and I feel like the, I, I do feel like there's a greediness in, in, in not as, and I'm not saying that Sean Evans specifically is greedy. I, I understand it's just a smart thing to do, right. but I just mean like culturally and like from an etiquette standpoint, like I, I do wish there was a, a little bit more respect for the platform as it's supposed to be which is, you know, people coming in and, and fresh blood and, 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 and just kind of this, this, this constant influx of new people being creative to the point where, like, hopefully they are successful and then they get their TV show and then, and then they've moved on, you know? Um, 
I don't know. It's I don't know if I'm necessarily articulating it that well, but no, I know exactly um, what you're saying, Chris. Like the inherent independent spirit of just being on YouTube, maybe that leads to success on YouTube, and maybe that leads, like you said, as a stepping stone to other things. But maintaining that independent spirit while you're on YouTube, yeah. Again, it makes sense for Chris and the Hot Wings crew, whatever umbrella company that's under, to draw a paycheck from Netflix. And that show is so clever because. It works on so many levels yeah. and also the star pat the sheer star power of that show when there's a giant celebrity on it everybody's gonna tune yeah. in anyway. everything about that show is brilliant like the, the concept it's of that brilliant. show is genuinely like one of the most brilliant shows that i've i've ever seen like from from like a sure, sheer concept standpoint as a talk show it's yep. brilliant um, it's got everything and there's no question that there's talent there but like i just i guess f- from my perspective it's just like this is you're already on netflix and that's really difficult to get on youtube is open to everybody and i feel like if somebody's coming into this they shouldn't be competing with someone who's on Netflix. I feel that same way about the people like the late night people who are like, or like Jimmy Fallon or, or like Jimmy Kimmel and they, they have their clips on YouTube. It's like, get the fuck out of here. Mm. You're, you don't need this. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> I feel a little bit more strongly about them than I feel about Sean Evans because at least Sean Evans came from there. You know what I mean? Like there's at least some reason, but like it, it just doesn't feel fair or, or appropriate really. Like it would be like Green Day playing a fucking bar. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, or your kid's recital or something. Yeah, it's like you don't, you don't <laughs> need to be here. This is a space specifically that you are stealing from an act that, that. that could potentially use it for no reason. You, you stand to gain nothing from this, actually, straight up. Like you, you gain absolute, absolute zero from being here as Green Day when the band that you just kicked off or that you took the place of is either just getting started maybe this maybe this this could have been the show where like an agent was in the crowd you know what i mean like and, and no, that's, you that's kind of how point. i feel about it no dude it's so important to say because i never thought about this before and we got we gotta let micah speak but i just there's something inherently wrong with what you're saying like i totally agree with everything you're saying and it's problematic because I'm, I'm picking on Nickelodeon today a lot but uh, just as an example because <laughs> i was under the roof when they started clamoring for YouTube content. But that was some that was a cable entity trying to evolve to meeting the kids' eyeballs where we you knew they were, which right. was YouTube. That was cable to YouTube. That wasn't subscription service to YouTube. That's different. That's that's right, a conflict. Yeah. 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 And, and that's an important point that I never thought of. Yeah. And just to be clear, I'd, I I want to make sure that this is very understood before we ask Micah. I I, I just I want to make it very clear that I understand that this makes perfect business sense. Mm. <laughs> like I don't, I Bottom don't begrudge line. it from a business perspective. This is more of a, this is, I, I, and I, I'm not even going to pretend like it's not an emotional argument. Like it is, it's totally an emotional argument. There's no necessary, there's no like legal basis for like why that shouldn't be allowed or whatever. But like, I just feel like generally spiritually and culturally, like I feel like, I feel like you should know when to step away from this platform if you've already gotten what you need out of it you you have your show on netflix you're not with us anymore we're ha- we're happy for you that's great like i'm never gonna begrudge you but like i mean you're 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 on a label basically and we are the indie bands still so there's a there's a difference there i love yeah. it i love that point michael let's hear from you about youtube i guess more from a both a hybrid of a consumer and a creator yeah, these days I really am just a consumer. I gave up on my channel when they changed the monetization rules and I could no longer meet it. And it's it's just one of those things of like, they still put ads on the videos. They just don't give you any money anymore. Yeah. And that's just oh, like, wow. well, that's garbage. <laughs> wow. So, and, and the thing is what something Dagan mentioned of like, when videos used to just be, you know, lower quality and nobody cared. And it's like, yeah, the problem is that you do have to put so much effort into these videos, how they look, how they sound, just to get people to watch it. And then to not get anything out of it. It's like, I started out doing this channel for fun, but to get people to watch the videos, it's like, well, you can't just talk about the game. You have to show gameplay. All right. So, you know, we'll capture gameplay for a couple hours and edit that down. And then people say like, oh, you have to have background music. And it's like, all right, I'll add that on. And that's more editing time. And then to not get paid for it, it's like, I didn't enjoy doing it that much. That really was the thing of like, it wasn't 
that much fun right. to have my little YouTube channel that I'm going to do this for literally zero benefit. Like there is, I started my YouTube channel because I wanted to just pretend I worked at IGN. That was the thing back in the day was I just wanted to have my own little video game show. Yeah. And I didn't really care if anyone watched it. It was just my own little show. And then it was once you get to the threshold of, oh, I actually am eligible for monetization. All right. I might as well. The sh you know, the channel makes a little bit of money, buy some of my games. All right. But then for them to eventually take that away and it's like, well, it's not that much fun anymore because the videos yeah. aren't just simple, you know, bit little videos. It's like now they do take all this extra work just to get anyone to watch it. And it's not monetized. So that that's when I stopped doing them. It was funny, though, to observe the changes over the years. As Chris mentioned, the point at which you couldn't swear, you know, like in, in videos at first, it was just like I don't like people were completely not swearing because they didn't know when it, the monetization would be cut off. Then it was kind of like, OK, don't swear within like the first minute of a video. But watching some of my favorite channels like Funhouse and Game Grumps trying to navigate this of like, yeah, this is who we are. Are we just going to stop being ourselves, you know, and watching them have to kind of make decisions of like, if we want to stay authentic, I guess we'll open up a Patreon because we are losing ad revenue. And, you know, trying to make money that way, like Game Grumps specifically has uncensored content that they post on their Patreon versus you'll get the bleeped out versions on YouTube for a lot of their stuff because <sighs> it's just like, well, we're talking about either them making zip on YouTube and it's yeah. their livelihood or, you know, just cutting out some of the swears. Well, it's it, so it, it was interesting to watch creators kind of to navigate those changes you know, over the years and some of it seeming just so over the top, but it is, it is weird. Like I, I watch YouTube a lot, um, but it, it is hard to not feel a little cynical about it when you see some of their practices firsthand, like the whole thing of like, yeah, I'm no longer monetized, but they still run ads on my videos and they still run their three minute ads ahead of the videos and all this stuff. It's like, but you can't give me a penny anymore yeah. type thing. It's, it's crazy, but I do still, watch it often what i find most interesting is actually when i can't find something and then i realize there's a gap here that there's still there's still room for youtube to e add even more content like i've recently been getting really into bread baking and while there are some baking specific channels most of these channels go for the frilly stuff baking cakes cupcake decoration all that type of stuff the channels that do breads are often like it's a lot of sourdough because that was very popular during the pandemic, for example. It's interesting when I can't find something and I say that's a niche that someone could eventually fill, you know, as as more and more people. I can't be the only one searching for this. Right. And just in a, in a space where for the most part you can find almost anything to be re to realize that there's something you can't find. And like, man, somebody could make a lot of money doing this instead. But that's what I've just been thinking recently as I sort of explore different hobbies. You know, you look up barbecue videos. There's a million channels, tons and tons of content. When it comes to barbecue, there hasn't been anything that I haven't been able to find. But when it comes to baking, which is just a little less popular, I suppose, that's when it gets more tricky. And you can find some very specific channels but not maybe finding everything that you're looking for. Uh, and that's just weird to me in the age where it seems like, like Chris said, you know, when we were younger and as everybody had a YouTube channel, like my, one of my friends had one and we would just put up videos of us dancing to different songs, like just weird stuff. We'd be like, look, we got 20 views. Like, oh my God, 20 people saw us dancing to black and yellow. That's crazy. That's so cool. I mean, Stuff like that. But nowadays it is just there's so much content available. You can find just anything, really. Uh, so it, it is just interesting to see how the platform has evolved. I can't get over paying for YouTube. That's a never. YouTube's free. I, I can't get I, I'm not ever going to pay for it. That's one of those things of like, no, this is a free platform. And that's where, too, Chris, I don't take too much like fault with people who like, you know, start on YouTube, 
move somewhere, like migrate somewhere else, but still keep the YouTube presence. Cause the reality is that's like, well, depending on where you went, I'm not paying for it. Like we don't have Netflix. I'm not going to pay $10 to watch rich people eat hot wings. I've actually never even seen people. I've never seen it, but it's like, I'm certainly not going to pay for that. So I'm going to watch it for free on YouTube. And if it's not free on YouTube, then I wouldn't watch it at all. You don't and mind for the some ads of these, though, Micah. You don't mind watching the ads? I know. It, it's fine. Doesn't oh, it man, is what it is. It drives me just, fucking crazy. I, I, I pay. Just, yeah, I, pay. I, I can't stand I, yeah, I pay yeah, me too. too. Like, I also pay. No I chance. Mean, the only time it's a problem is when I'm listening to like ASMR videos and like right <laughs> in the middle of this woman like crunching up a bunch of soap and then it's like, buy, you know, buy more acorns. I'm like, that's ah, problem, the yeah. acorn ad. But, yeah. you know, what can you do? But that's the thing for me, like, like Pat McAfee, for example, uh, who has this show on ESPN now, is it called? Mm-hmm. But it's like, I'm not going to watch television for this. Like, you're not going to get me to fire up the TV and go watch it there. But I'll listen to you on YouTube. So long I as can... you still put your stuff here, yeah, they I'll do still it. watch they... it. Yeah. Yeah. Watch TV. <laughs> I guess to me, I, I just kind of view it as like, if it's, if people aren't going to go to see it, then why, why even pursue that in the first, I don't know. I, I, it kind of leads into this own kind of question of, if it's not good enough where it is and where it's going, then why would, why even, no, why even bother making it? For sure. So yeah, like it, it feels like double dipping, but yeah. it, the reality is that it's like you're creating two audiences really. Yeah. Because no, I, someone I like my dad doesn't use YouTube the way I do. And he would be delighted to be like, Oh, he's on ESPN now. I watch ESPN every day, but it's like, but I'm not going to go watch it on TV. I'm going to stay on the internet. So like they really yeah. are just creating two separate audiences and and reaping all the value yeah and then they 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 also get preferential treatment in algorithms by the way that's that's kind of the that's kind of the issue with it that i have is that oh. is that oh yeah the big jimmy, jimmy kimmel sure. jimmy fallon these people are not going to ever get a video demonetized ever like they 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 are intrinsically grandfathered into like everything they do is monetized and it's fine mm. um and they are not subject to the same rules and scrutiny and that's frustrating and they're weighted differently and also it should be noted that like if you get a video demonetized uh on youtube that basically i mean youtube is a platform right it's a it's a website that is designed to make money that is what it wants to do so when it puts videos in your recommended the videos that they're going to put in your recommended are videos that have ads on them so if your video does gets demonetized then that's no longer in recommended by the way so it's gone like you're not going to get that recommended thing. Oh, so that's the flow. And, and also, if you get enough videos demonetized that you're not in recommended things, then your channel just kind of gets generally kind of swept outside of. Even, even so, even if you do post like something that is monetized, it's probably not going to get recommended either, because wow. it's from a channel with like however many yellow dollar signs on it. And it's just like the thing that frustrates me about it is that it really did used to feel at the very least or maybe it never was but it felt authentically like a meritocracy in the sense that there's so there was always luck involved obviously but there was this feeling that if you just did something that people were gravitating towards you could find success in that but now it feels like if something fails like if i post a video right and it doesn't do well i don't know that that's my fault I used to know. It used to be obvious. Like a yeah. video didn't do well. It was just like, oh, this title's not good, or like the thumbnail was this, or or um, you know, maybe I, it just wasn't that interesting, or maybe it just wasn't that funny. You could tell immediately. And yeah. then all of these rules came in, and it's just like, well, did this fail because it's bad, or did it fail because it's being like weighed down by this thing that I have no control over and no knowledge of, really, on a, on an intrinsic level. And if I don't know that. If I don't know why something is failing, how can I improve if it yeah. is indeed my fault? How can you like adjust? You can't yeah. actually learn or adjust or gain any meaningful information out of that at all because you're not being treated fairly. And that's that I think is the most frustrating part of it to me. It's just like because I know that I can make a video and it, I'll spend a fuck ton of time making sure it's good. But like, I have no idea if that's <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it'll even matter. And that's Does really the YouTube part of ever it. speak to that, Chris, from a creator perspective or from a creator friendly perspective of, you know, we understand for those, you know, um, no, old timers, it used to be a science, you know, can we help you? Can we be more, you know, creator friendly so we could help you 
be sick, or they just feel they don't feel they no, need to do it's, that. I guess it's basically impossible to get their attention unless something really, really drastic happens. Um, like you have to really. I mean, people make fun. People used to make fun of people going on Twitter to like tag Team YouTube or whatever. Uh, mm. A lot of creators used to have to like tag Team YouTube on Twitter and uh, like, hey, this video got demonetized. What the fuck? And then like their audience would like swarm the tweet and then they would get a response. And and people used to make fun of that. But that really was genuinely the only way to get in touch with these people. It worked like it worked because they didn't want to deal with like a, a huge fucking thing. So it was like, oh, yeah, yeah OK, we'll we'll go and we'll check it out. Um, And when that's the most reliable way to get in touch with them, it's kind of. You know, like that's that's fucked. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I've, I've ranted and raved. Well, talk to me about this, you guys. You guys may have some knowledge of this. I think about this a lot with YouTube, and I know they're fueled by Google. I know this is big willy shit. Like it's they're they're, they're they sort of. I mean, they're kind of cornering the market, right? Like, talk to me about competition with them. I mean, I know there's been things. I know Twitch is for streaming. I know there's been things that have come along, like Vimeo, that have gained modest success, but there's really nobody that's come into the market that seriously competed with YouTube for this sort of thing, to my knowledge. Or am I wrong about that? No, I mean, you're not wrong about that. There, I think, I guess Rumble would be its biggest competitor now, but the thing about, and I like the idea of a Rumble or something like that, but it's just that it becomes a place where things that can't get monetized on YouTube go. So it, it, it takes on the certain character of that specific content as opposed to just being a holistic place that also allows that so until, oh, so so until someone fi- like there's just no reason to play anywhere but youtube it, online companies trend towards monopolies very quickly so this happens here in a, in a major way and by the way youtube google tried to buy twitch you know they got outbid so they wanted that too they would have also owned that and, and that would have been interesting back before amazon bought it so um that's some disney shit <laughs> trying to swallow everything up. Yeah. yeah, it sucks. It's gross. So, but yeah, YouTube is the brand name. That's where they know people. You know, it's a household name. Everybody, I always, I always pick on the grandmas. So I'll pick on the grandpas this time. Every grandpa knows YouTube. So it's like that's where you go. And um, it's so funny though that somebody just can't break out the Rumble thing. I get because it's like, it's like R-rated YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. Or PG thirteen, or YouTube After Dark, or whatever you want to call it. And I could see it go, you know, it's going to go in that direction. But then YouTube ha- seems to cover all the bases with content, not only for genre and interests, but for age groups. Like they've, they've kind of done it all. You know, yeah. it, it, I know I speak about this a lot on the podcast, but something that's happened over the last five years that really kind of shocked me in a way. There's, there was no way we could have predicted this from our end inside of animation is that what happened was all the big entertainment companies or animation studios that are under the umbrella of these Hollywood production studios or entertainment studios, whatever, Paramount, Nickelodeon, whatever, Disney, Warner Brothers or Cartoon Network, they all went to YouTube to be an entity that also existed on YouTube. That was the weird thing. They didn't start, they do have their subscription services, but yeah. YouTube is also important for Nick Jr., let's say. 50 million subscribers on YouTube or whatever. So that's the thing too. Not only did the independents flock to YouTube, but the companies flock to YouTube. That's how much of a cultural mainstay it's become, which is kind of shocking when you think about it. And not just entertainment companies, any kind of corporate, right? Think of anything, Toyota. Everybody has a YouTube channel. You know, it's, uh, it's become this, I mean- cultural necessity almost for everything which is interesting who, who could have predicted that 15 years ago you yeah know, 20 it, years ago it's pretty crazy uh, especially because that was around the time that a lot of social media sites were dying like that we were used to like oh okay this site is here and then in like a year or two it'll be replaced by something else like i remember mm-hmm. just distinctly like friendster and myspace and all these things coming <laughs> off and then facebook was there and it was just like well how long is this one gonna last and then facebook's i mean facebook is not really important anymore but it's still there and it's still and it's way more important as it is even in its dwindling relevance than MySpace fucking ever was. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. And so Well the boomers found Facebook. Th- yeah. But then <laughs> and like, ran with it. They really then, did. But that that was that was a key point in time with like YouTube, Twitter and Facebook where it's like those were just at the right time they just hit and then they just didn't go away. 
and uh, they just became like really entrenched and they open and they were open to everybody. And that's kind of the thing. That's why I don't feel like any any competitor is really going to take part in it because the, every competitor is going to have to differentiate themselves in the sense that YouTube is a necessary reference point for its success. Like it's like Rumble is is it's just YouTube, but it's like it's just like it's a lot of right wing stuff or like Truth Social, for example, where it's like <laughs> it's it's just Twitter, but like mega anti Semitic, and it's like I, I don't. I, <laughs> So like I don't I don't know like what it, it's inherently like it 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 inherently becomes a place where it's like I don't really that seems weird because there's already like an angle there that isn't holistically kind of um holistically neutral like Twitter like the staff at Twitter might have bias or whatever the staff at YouTube might have bias whatever but like no one would consider like YouTube like like a liberal place or anything like or like a conservative place or no one could say no one can even consider twitter that especially now with like elon and you know owning it and all the crazy shit going on there it's like it's it's right. it's still a very neutral place so in order to to really make something that that attracts anybody to it it would have to it would have to be predicated on the state of the other platform and not by offering something very specific or unique and that's kind of the problem because who the fuck is going to want to go to oh it's this but focus on that and it's like well no that's that might work for like a streaming service it works for like uh what's that horror movie streaming service um oh my god i can't remember what i know what you're talking about oh. just, somebody like just slasher or something like that or oh I'll god it damn it whatever like it, it's like that like it works for a streaming service where there's like genres of entertainment but like i mean as like a social media platform i don't want to i don't want to I, I don't really need that really Especially when all of this, all of the content that I need is still on YouTube in some form or sh some way, shape, or form. Um, so I don't know. It's it's crazy, interesting. It's a good conversation. I've been happy yeah. to listen to it, get everyone's perspectives. I love YouTube, and I'll continue to be a big consumer of it. I watch it every day. And yeah, you got to. It's so funny to me. Not Micah so much, but just a lot of people are very dismissive of paying for YouTube, and I'm like, it's the best subscription I have, probably. Oh, yeah. I think it's the only one that I wouldn't get rid of. It's worth yeah, it's its one weight. Of the ones gold, I wouldn't, like a, that one in Spotify and Spotify probably I would never get rid of, and maybe Amazon Prime. But yeah, um, all right, my friend. The horror subscription service is is Shutter. Shutter, Shutter that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, Slasher. I was close. Yeah, and you know, I just want to tell you guys. I know we have a lot of younger listeners, and Micah and Chris may be mystified by this too. But I talked about I referenced public access TV, which is gone now. But it's so interesting. I went on YouTube and realized it's come full circle in this really kind of far out meta way because you could just watch old public access, access compilations on YouTube now. <laughs> and I highly recommend yeah. it because this was the spirit of what I think of when YouTube started, just people in their basements doing shit late at night on TV and you could tune in. You know, Sometimes it, ha it pertained to your neighborhood and sometimes it was just an old guy showing you how to build something. Yeah. Or, you know, somebody doing church music on a Sunday morning or something. I, but it's so fucking it. You guys, ha especially you younger oh, people, you I have to it. watch it. It's so good. Yeah, I, I remember public access. I, I remember actually, God, it's, I've never felt more 30 in my life, but <laughs> <laughs> I remember trying to do something on public access. Like I wanted to do like, oh, a sh shit. I wanted to do like a show, like one episode of something. Um, just to do it and like record it and just so I can have it on file or whatever. But I never I never got around to doing it. Um, but that was like an option for me at, at a certain point where that I was considering. That's so uh, cool. Which is funny. I never understood how it worked. Like, how did you tap into it? I understand it was usually free or maybe it required a small fee. I don't remember. I don't remember um, how it worked. Yeah. There was a time. I think, I think a lot of them were like studios you would go to. And it would okay. basically be like almost like a variety show style situation. You know, yeah, like where they would like have rent the studio blocks. space or something. Like I, I don't remember exactly how. It and I think Most I think part of it comes from the agreement. People would know better than me, but I think that like there needed to be open channels like that in order for the big corporations to get access to airwave, like their specific airwave call signs and stuff. So I think that's where public access comes from, like something that doesn't need to be paid for and isn't corporate or whatever. No commercial, very similar no to C-SPAN and other nothing. stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Right. All right, my friends. Well, that was fun. Thank you for being here with me today. This is a great 
episode. Let's go around the horn and say goodbye to everyone. Chris, goodbye to you. Have a good weekend. We're recording on a Friday, of course. So that's why yeah. I say that. It goes live on a Monday. It'll be a little confusing for people that listen to it. But. <laughs> you too, man. Have a good one. Thank you. Uh, Dagan, goodbye to you, my friend. Uh, it was good seeing you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Of course. That's right. Yeah, we have to record still. So we'll get to that. I'm ready to go. We have to catch up. And uh, Micah, I'll see you shortly when we're done here recording. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I want to say Dagan brought up one of my favorite memories. I loved public public access when I was a kid. My favorite thing was always the polka party. You know, it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday from I think like 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. was the polka videos because there, there's a big Polish community where I grew up. And so there was often these polka dances, you know, like polka parties and, you know, at the lodge or whatever. And people would videotape them. And then it would be on public access. And I loved it as a child. I'd watch it with my Nana. We'd just watch all the old people dance and they'd often have like coordinating outfits. It was a little sad though when you realized like, okay, it's 2005 and they're showing this footage from 1998 and you're like, a lot of these old people probably dead. Yeah, you realize you're watching like, oh no, Mm -hmm. like a lot of these people were barely hanging on already. But I can't remember the host. There was this host in a suit and he'd be like, today we're going to watch this video. And it's like, please enjoy it. And you'd kick it over and then, then you just watch three hours of, of polka dancing. But I do, I loved that. That was one of my favorite things as a child uh, and adult. <laughs> it sounds like you genuinely loved it, but I'm wondering if public access in general was like the beginning of liking things ironically. Like you knew it was bad, but you had to tune in type of thing. I think for Gen Xers, it probably was the beginning of that. It was like, I have to watch this woman with her pipe organ and her husband singing church music like that because <laughs> they're terrible at it, that type of thing. That was another thing too. There was no bar for talent. You could just do whatever the hell you wanted yeah. and maybe get an audience and maybe not, but you could give it the old college try. I don't know. There's something cool about that era. And uh, I think you, I, I don't know. I just predict YouTube is going to come back to this thing of like, the millennial set trying to emulate the things they grew up with on YouTube because it was different. Now everybody comes in and there's, it just feels like everybody comes in a superstar now, even if they don't have the audience yet. It's like, yeah. okay, this guy's going to be big. Well, you see it in and a lot of got, this. He knows the, production, he knows filming, he knows lighting, it's edited, it's yeah. funny, it's, it's well written. Like, what, where are these kids coming? I don't even know. It's like they're so good at it already. You see it a lot in the clips that go viral now. Of like the, most of the it's it's funny when you think about it because a lot of the clips that go viral now on Twitter and elsewhere are they do have an air of like that old YouTube style in the sense of like it is like kind of handy cam and like you know handheld and it's not like professional or whatever. But the thing about it is that it's like a lot of it's fake. You know what I mean? Like a lot of it is like emulating, oh, or right. or like or performative in some way, and it's like damn. Like we're really, we're really trying to get back there, but like this ain't it. <laughs> it's weird. All right, let's go. It's time to be gone. Uh, thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support. Appreciate you. Couldn't do without you. Patreon.com slash last day media, last day media store for merch until next time. Goodbye. Constellation is a product of last stand media and Collins last stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show was conceived by and is directed and hosted by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is my brother, Dagan Moriarty. The show is produced by Last Stand's executive producer, Dustin Furman, and is edited by associate producer, Ben Smith. All Last Stand theme music is by Ramon Narvaez, and all of our graphics and logos are by Dagan Moriarty. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's podcasts, including Constellation, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest support tier, and we're infinitely grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. 